This podcast contains descriptions of violence against children and adult language and is not suitable for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Suffer the Little Children, the true crime podcast giving voices back to the victims of child abuse and shining a harsh spotlight on the parents, guardians, and caretakers who silence them. I'm your host, Lane, and this is episode 123, the AJ Frund mega episode. On April 18, 2019, Joanne Cunningham and Drew Frund called 911 to report their five year old son, AJ, missing from the family's home in Crystal Lake, Illinois. Days later, police discovered A.J.'s battered body in a shallow grave, and both Joanne and Drew were charged with the murder of their little boy. I've told A.J.'s story in parts over the course of two regular episodes, a few update episodes, and multiple posts on Suffer the Little Children blog. A.J. was the first child I ever featured on both the blog and the podcast, and he holds a special place in my heart. Because I covered this story over two years ago, and in such a fragmented way, In this episode, I'm putting it all together into one mega-episode, comprising all of my previous coverage about AJ, as well as any updates I've found that I haven't yet covered. Some of it is newly recorded, but most of it is compiled from past episodes, making it easier to get the full picture of AJ's story all in one place. This is the tragic story of AJ Friend. I'd like to thank my newest patrons, starting with one whose name I somehow got wrong in her shout-out a couple of weeks ago, Dana Z. from Bakersfield, California. Sorry about that, Dana. Thanks also to Leticia D. from Fullerton, California, Katie C. from Jackson, California, Ronnie E. from Peterborough in the UK, Melissa D. from San Francisco, California, and Ashley R. from The Great Unknown. Thank you all so much for your support. You'll probably notice as you listen to the first part of today's mega episode that I've chosen to bleep out the name of AJ's younger brother. When I first started making the podcast, I was much more naive about a lot of things, but it didn't take me long to understand the many reasons why the names of surviving children shouldn't be published in these cases without their guardian's consent. If you've listened to my previous coverage about AJ, or really any of my first 22 episodes, you'll probably be relieved that I've chosen not to include my original intro theme, which opened both of AJ's previous episodes, numbers 1 and 22. I've also made leaps and bounds as far as my editing abilities since these episodes came out, so this mega episode should be infinitely more listenable, although probably no less infuriating based on the subject matter. That said, here goes. The following is from episode 1, AJ Friend originally released on February 25th, 2020. Today's story begins with a 911 call placed at approximately 9 a.m. on Thursday, April 18th, 2019. The caller was a 60-year-old man named Andrew Frund Sr., who was calling to report his 5-year-old son, Andrew Frund Jr., missing from the family's home in Crystal Lake, Illinois, where the father, Drew, and the missing boy, A.J., lived with A.J.'s 4-year-old brother and the boy's 36-year-old mother, Joanne Cunningham. Drew reported last seeing A.J. around 9.30 the previous night when the boy went to bed, but a few days' time would reveal a much darker truth when Drew would ultimately lead investigators to little A.J.'s body. 911, what's the address of your emergency? Uh, 94 Dole Avenue, Crystal Lake, Illinois. Okay, and one more time for confirmation. 94 Dole, D-O-L-E. Yep, I got it. And the phone number you're calling from? Okay, tell me exactly what happened. Um, we, uh, we have a missing child, um, woke up this morning and, uh, he wasn't, he wasn't... How old is uh, the child? The yeah, missing child. Yeah, how old is he? He's five. 
And what was the last scene where? Um, a Mario, uh, like blue, long sleeve sweatshirt and uh, a black sweatpants. And is he a uh, male white? Yes. Mm. And when was the last time you seen him? Uh, last night, uh, probably 9.30, uh, when he went to bed. Okay. Are you the father? Yes. Yes. you know where he might have went? No. Um, we canvassed the neighborhood. Yeah, I went to the local park, um, the, the, the local gas station down here where we sometimes take him to buy treats. Um, I spoke with the assistant principal over there at the school where the park is, and they, they haven't seen uh, Kim or any other child. I, I have no idea where he would be. Okay. So you put him to bed last night, so he was in his pajamas, and then when you tried yeah. to get him for school, he wasn't there, and then you left around for a bit? Yes. What time was he supposed to be at school? Well, he doesn't go to school, but I had a doctor's appointment this morning. When I got back from the doctor's appointment, um, and I checked in on him, said good morning, and he wasn't there. So that would have been what time was that? about between 8.15 and 8.30. Have you checked everywhere, like under tables or uh, in closets? The closets, the basement, the garage, everywhere. Okay. What's your child's name? Uh, Andrew. Last name Trend. We call him AJ. And Trend is T R E N D. F R E E U N D. And what's the middle? Um, Thomas. In his date of birth. Okay. And is his mom at the residence as well? Yes. And what's your name, sir? Uh, Andrew Senior. Okay. Do you have any pets in the house? Yes. Are any missing as well or no? Nope. Was any of the doors open? No. I mean, you know, no outside doors or anything like that. No doors or windows? No. 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 Officer's phone on door now. Okay, yeah, I see him. And then just let me know. But you checked the house, right? Yeah. 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 We've been through the house, like, completely. Yeah. Let me know when the officer's at your uh, door. Uh, he's here right now. Okay, I'll let you go. Drew's flat affect and obvious indifference during that 911 call makes the hair on the back of my neck stand up. Also, the fact that he volunteers next to no information without being prompted by the 911 operator is highly suspicious. The call is just under five minutes in length, but Drew doesn't even commit initially to calling AJ his son. Instead, he refers to a missing child and uses the pronouns he and him, but he doesn't indicate that the missing child is his own son until the dispatcher directly asks him, Are you the father? Even more concerning, Drew doesn't mention AJ's name until exactly three minutes into the call, which, according to statement analyst Peter Hyatt, is a red flag likely indicating emotional distancing from and possible hostility toward the victim. There are a lot more indicators of distancing, deception, and guilty knowledge in that call, but suffice it to say that within days, it would be proven that both Drew and AJ's mother, Joanne, knew exactly what happened to that little boy. Before I talk about the tragic end of AJ's life, though, I want to give some comprehensive backstory on the people who not only brought AJ into this world, but allegedly took him out of it. Andrew Thomas Frund Sr. was born in 1958. He was popular in high school, played football and baseball, was a member of the Crystal Lake Community High School's yearbook committee and senior class varsity club, and was voted both junior class prom prince and the class of 1977's most desirable date. Yearbook photos show a handsome, primly dressed young man with a shy smile. Classmates remember him as a very shy boy who was nonetheless loved by his peers, especially the female ones. When Drew was 16, his mother, Helen, filed for divorce from his father, Robert, alleging infidelity, mental cruelty, and severe alcoholism on her husband's part. Drew and his older brother remained living with their mother after the divorce. 
Drew described his relationship with his father and his brother as distant, but he was close with his mother until she died in 2006. In 1981, Drew got a bachelor's degree in accounting from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and in 1984, he graduated from John Marshall Law School in Chicago with a law degree. He was hired by a law firm in his hometown of Crystal Lake, but in 1994, he was asked to leave because of his alcohol problems. He did seek treatment at that point, but over time, during stressful periods in his life, he tended to relapse, returning to the heavy use of alcohol and opioids. After losing his job, Drew continued practicing law from his home at 94 Dole Avenue for the next 15 years. He also had a part-time job in 2012 as a bag boy at a local grocery store, telling fellow employees he was trying to drum up business to explain why an attorney would be bagging groceries. One co-worker, a divorced father of two named Michael York, rented a basement room in the Dole Avenue house after hiring Drew to represent him in a custody battle. While living in Drew's house, Michael quickly realized that Drew had a major pill problem. He told the Chicago Tribune about seeing prescription pill bottles all over the house, some with Vicodin printed on the labels. 21-year-old Lori Cunningham was the mother of a toddler son and pregnant with her second child when her husband, 24-year-old Joseph Cunningham III, was arrested and pled guilty to burglarizing a home. Two weeks later, on February 28, 1983, Joanne Doris Cunningham was born. Later that year, Lori filed for both a divorce and an order of protection from Joseph, saying he had an uncontrollable temper, drank heavily, and was a man possessed of a mean and violent disposition. Joseph eventually admitted that his family took a lot of abuse from him. Joseph never freed himself from his downward spiral, spending years doing drugs, fighting, burglarizing, and being hospitalized for depression and suicide attempts. In 2003, when he was 44 years old and homeless, he was found unresponsive in a parking lot after a fall caused an ultimately fatal head injury. Severe cirrhosis of the liver was also listed as a contributing factor in his autopsy report. Despite her hot mess of a father, Joanne described her childhood as good, and her mother, now Lori Hughes, agreed that she and her two kids had a normal, happy life. Lori remarried when Joanne was seven, but Joanne had a good relationship with her stepfather and was only disciplined as a child by being grounded or sent to her room. In elementary school, Joanne played basketball, ran track, and wanted to be an artist. Her plans were derailed when she got pregnant at 16 by her boyfriend of two years, 18-year-old Christopher Butler. Joanne dropped out of school and moved into Christopher's parents' house. The couple's son, Austin, was born in July of 2000, and Joanne soon got her GED and devoted her life to her son. The following July in 2001, Joanne's older brother, Joseph, died of suicide, hanging himself from a tree. He had cocaine and marijuana in his system. Joanne, who described her brother as her best friend, had a hard time coping with his loss, saying his death left a huge gap in her life. Joanne's rocky, sometimes violent relationship with Christopher lasted almost 10 years. He was charged with domestic battery in 2003 after punching Joanne in the stomach at a neighbor's house. Joanne posted his bail and dropped the charges. Finally, when Austin was five, Joanne and Christopher broke up for the last time, and Joanne and Austin moved in with Lori and her husband. Lori described Joanne as a loving, attentive mother to Austin, describing how Joanne spent time teaching the little boy letters, numbers, reading, and even how to play Monopoly at the age of five. Joanne became licensed in cosmetology in 2005, and in 2006, she started dating the man who would become her first husband, former Marine and Iraq War veteran Craig Summercamp Jr. They got engaged on New Year's Eve 2007 when Craig gave Joanne a $10,000 engagement ring. Around the same time, Joanne started taking prescription painkillers for chronic back pain from working long hours on her feet as a hairstylist and cosmetology teacher and fibromyalgia. Joanne and Craig got married in May of 2009, and two years later, she became a licensed foster parent, taking in her six-year-old godson. The foster care agency knew she was on a prescription pain medication, but they believed her when she said it wouldn't affect her ability to care for the boys. Things went downhill from there, though. By January of 2012, when Craig filed for divorce, Joanne needed a cocktail of 12 to 15 painkillers to make it through the day, including Norco, Percocet, and Morphine, which she bought illegally on the street. Craig accused her of getting violent, punching him twice in the face, throwing hot coffee at him, and trying to kick him down the stairs. He told the Daily Mail in 2019 that the marriage started well, but after drugs came into the picture, it was like a switch flipped in her head. 
During the divorce process, Joanne found herself crying in the hallway of the courthouse. Drew noticed her sitting there, approached her, and ultimately offered to represent her pro bono. Meeting Drew sent Joanne into an even steeper downward spiral of drug use and inexplicable behavior. She claimed she couldn't work because, on top of suffering from an injured ankle and fibromyalgia, she had to be home to care for Austin and her foster son. Joanne and the boys were permitted to stay through the end of summer in the house she and Craig had shared so the boys could finish out the school year. She called police repeatedly to her former marital home throughout 2012, telling them the house was bugged, her phone and email had been hacked, and that someone had her under surveillance. She also yelled at neighbors, accusing them of calling the Department of Children and Family Services, or DCFS, on her, which she also accused her estranged husband of doing. Meanwhile, Craig, who had moved out earlier that year, caught her trying to sell his possessions at a garage sale, supposedly to make her car payment. In June of 2012, DCFS did receive two hotline calls reporting that Joanne was abusing prescription drugs and neglecting her foster son. That case was closed as unfounded after a caseworker determined that even though Joanne was going through a difficult divorce and financial struggles, there were no concerns for the children's safety. Drew, her divorce attorney at that time, even spoke to the caseworker and gave Joanne a glowing review as a mother. It wasn't long before Joanne really went off the deep end with her paranoia. She apparently thought one of the neighbors who called DCFS was trying to kill her, telling Austin that her bedroom was a safe room and that if they left the room, the neighbor would kill them. Of course, this left Austin terrified and in tears. During the summer of 2012, Lori and other relatives tried to confront Joanne about her drug use, but she denied it and refused to take their suggestions to get into rehab. Lori told the Chicago Tribune that Joanne's mental state was deteriorating rapidly and that she was even hallucinating. By August of 2012, Joanne and the boys had essentially moved into Drew's house on Dole Avenue in Crystal Lake, leaving Craig's house with almost $20,000 in damages. The house stunk of dog urine and feces and was infested with both mold and insects. There was also major damage from kitchen appliance fires. At this point, the caseworker overseeing Joanne's foster son got fed up with her and called the police after finding out that Joanne had moved with the boys without notifying the agency. Her seven-year-old foster son was removed from her custody, and Joanne surrendered her foster license. She didn't surrender her driver's license, though, unfortunately for 12-year-old Austin, who lived in constant fear that he and his mother, who frequently drove under the influence of her pain med cocktail, would get in an accident. She even took Austin along on her drug runs when she visited her supplier in Elkhorn, Wisconsin, which was about an hour's drive from Crystal Lake. She even paid Drew for his legal services by providing him with pills. When Joanne first moved in with Drew, his boarder, Michael York, described her as personable, outgoing, and attractive, although he said that changed very quickly. She was soon pretty much always high and spent most of her days sleeping. She and Drew were romantically involved, but they kept separate bedrooms. Michael told the Tribune that Joanne had a powder keg temper and described her as being like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. In late August, Joanne started leaving Austin with her mother, Lori, for extended periods beginning when Joanne was hospitalized in St. Alexius Mental Health Facility for several days after texting Drew after an argument that she was going to hang herself in his house. When Austin was living with Joanne at Drew's house, he was subjected to unbelievable levels of neglect and horror. The house was filthy and unsanitary, with animal urine and feces all over the place, dirty dishes piled up in the sink, and dirty clothes piled everywhere. Austin was expected to clean it, and if it wasn't clean enough fast enough, Joanne would yell at him. Often there was no food for Austin to eat. Sometimes all he had was marshmallows and water, and that was when the water in the house was working at all. He told Lori he ate meals maybe four out of seven days a week, and he went to school every day with neither a lunch nor money to buy one. When there was food in the house, he was expected to cook for his mother and her divorce attorney upwards of four times a week. Austin often had nothing clean to wear, sometimes for up to a week at a time. Lori would sometimes pick up as many as 10 loads of laundry at a time from the Dole Avenue house, all of it reeking of cat urine, and wash it before returning it. The utilities in the house worked sporadically at best. There was no television, cable, or telephone in the house. Often there was no hot water and sometimes no water at all. At the beginning of the cold season in 2012, the house wasn't even heated. When Austin would return home from school each day, Joanne wouldn't even leave her bedroom, leaving Austin to fend for himself with zero parental guidance. 
Austin was frequently left alone overnight while Joanne and Drew went out God knows where, leaving the poor kid with no idea where they were and no phone to contact them or anyone else in case of an emergency. On one such occasion, Austin was left alone overnight while he was very sick, experiencing vomiting, diarrhea, and a fever of 102 degrees, and his mother was nowhere to be found. On top of the ridiculous amount of neglect this poor kid had to live with, he also had to watch his mother and Drew get into shouting matches at least weekly that devolved into physical violence. He witnessed his mother punching Drew, Drew shoving Joanne, Joanne pulling a knife on Drew, and Drew pushing her down the stairs in retaliation. Austin also reported that Drew would often put on a random army uniform he had somehow acquired, although he never served, and walk around the house with a gun in his hand, terrifying the kid on a regular basis. Once, Drew went into the Crystal Lake police station wearing just his underwear and a blanket, saying that in a rage, Joanne had thrown pens and pencils at him and punched him in the head because he said he was too tired that evening to work on her divorce case. He declined to press charges in that incident. Three more times the same month, police were called to the house, and even though Drew didn't want charges pressed, DCFS was called on October 22nd because Austin was in the house when one of the fights started. DCFS did not even investigate the complaint. The other two domestic calls in October took place on October 25th when Michael York, who had almost finished moving out by then, saw his daughter run down the basement stairs screaming for him. He ran upstairs to find Drew standing over Joanne with his fist clenched, asking her, You want another one of these? When Michael tried to intervene, Drew nearly knocked him down the stairs, even ripping Michael's shirt. Drew was arrested for battery. Also in October, Joanne's divorce trial with Craig began but the judge had to delay the proceedings when Joanne showed up in court high as a kite. Later the same month, Joanne and Drew earned themselves some jail time for stealing some of Craig's things in violation of a court order. Joanne was ordered to spend 30 days in McHenry County Jail, while Drew got a 14-day sentence. Just before being booked to start her sentence, Joanne dropped Austin off at Lori and her boyfriend Brian's house, asking them to take care of him. After that, Austin never again lived with his mother even though she did petition for custody of him in January of 2013, going as far as to tell her 12-year-old son that if he didn't come back to live with her, she would kill herself. Austin, who had previously locked himself in the bathroom and refused to come out during a visit with Joanne, flat out told his grandparents that if he was forced to live with his mother, he would absolutely run away. Lori and Brian immediately sought an order of protection on behalf of Austin against his mother, telling the court that Joanne was guilty of depriving her son of medical care, adequate food, and a healthy residence, and that returning the child to his mother's custody would put him in danger of physical, emotional, and mental harm. When Austin moved in with Lori and Brian permanently, he had nothing but a shirt, shorts, and a pair of shoes so old and dirty that Lori had to throw them away. In November, Joanne's ex-boyfriend and Austin's father, Christopher Butler, died at age 32 of a drug overdose, marking the third person Joanne had lost with substance abuse as a factor, after her father and her brother. On Christmas Eve of 2012, Lori called DCFS to report environmental neglect and an injurious environment causing danger to Austin, as well as Joanne's abuse of prescription drugs. By some massive failure on the part of DCFS, that case was closed as unfounded. You're going to notice by the end of this episode that the failure of DCFS is a running theme in this case to a maddening degree. December also brought about the official end of Joanne and Craig's marriage. The judge in that case found that Joanne had repeatedly acted violently toward Craig and denied her request for continued financial support because, the judge said, she was unemployed for no credible reason. Around the same time, Joanne's addiction to painkillers gave way to something even worse. When she posted bail for a woman she had become friends with during her own jail stint, the woman repaid her for her kindness with heroin, and this is when things went from bad to worse. By the beginning of 2013, Joanne and Drew were in such dire straits and so mired in their drug addictions that they resorted to doing anything they could think of to make money. On one occasion, they scored a whole 18 bucks by recycling soda cans and empty bullet casings, and a fight broke out between them when Joanne accused Drew of stealing some of the cash. A friend happened to stop by mid-fight and called the police after seeing Joanne screaming at Drew that he was a loser and beating on him with her fists, while Drew merely crouched in a ball covering his face with his hands and letting her beat him. He already had a black eye from a previous incident. Joanne was charged with aggravated battery. Later that year, Joanne was arrested three more times in June and July, this time on charges of retail theft. Drew was also arrested once for the same thing. 
According to police, Joanne would use discarded receipts to quote-unquote return items she had just shoplifted, and Drew would make off with stolen clothing by layering his own clothing over top. He would also, police said, hide smaller items in his compression socks and his spandex shorts. Police found stolen merchandise in their car, along with drug paraphernalia, including syringes. And in Joanne's purse, they found handwritten notes on pink paper listing which items to steal from which stores. Joanne was convicted of one count of retail theft and one count of battery against Drew. She was sentenced to anger management counseling and drug treatment. Drew also agreed to get help with his drug and alcohol addiction as a sentencing requirement in his retail theft case. By then, he had suffered a stroke and allowed his law license to expire after he failed to register with the state and to fulfill requirements for continuing education. He got a short-term job doing manual labor, but after an accident in which a service elevator crushed his hand, he and Joanne relied on his disability checks. By this time, Joanne was heavily pregnant with her second child. On October 14, 2013, 30-year-old Joanne Cunningham checked into the hospital in Woodstock, Illinois, with fresh track marks on her body and a baby on the way. Andrew Thomas Frund, Jr. was born that night at 38 weeks gestation by emergency cesarean section, weighing a mere 5 pounds 7 ounces. When he was born, A.J. showed obvious signs of opioid withdrawal, including, according to hospital records, tremors, sneezing, excessive crying, sleep disturbance, and an overactive startle reflex. A test of his umbilical cord blood showed a heroin derivative, prompting doctors to give the newborn morphine to alleviate his symptoms. When Lori visited the hospital to meet her brand new grandson, she made a point of sharing with a nurse her concerns about Joanne and Drew's ability to care for a baby. Joanne herself admitted to medical staff that she had taken three medications that very day, telling them that she had used heroin at the beginning of her pregnancy, but stopped when she learned she was pregnant. To help her control her withdrawal and cravings, she was, at the time of AJ's birth, taking Subutex. Drug testing at the hospital revealed that both Joanne and Drew were positive for opioids. Joanne, for her part, also had benzodiazepines in her system. Seven days after A.J. was born, his grandmother, Lori, was granted permanent custody of his 13-year-old brother, Austin. DCFS opened an investigation. When A.J. was finally discharged in November at nearly a month of age, instead of being released to his parents, he was placed in temporary protective custody and spent the next 19 months in the care of Joanne's cousin, who called him an easy baby. Records show that A.J. formed a solid bond with his foster mother right away. She wanted to adopt him, but the court's goal was to reunite the baby with his parents if they could provide a safe, loving home. At first, it seemed like Joanne and Drew would never regain custody of their son. The house on Dole Avenue was still filthy and disgusting, filled with black mold, garbage, and animal feces with standing water several inches deep in the basement. In late November, Joanne was back in the hospital, this time for a heroin overdose. Drew was also using drugs at that time. Neither made any attempt during the first several weeks to facilitate visitation with their son. In January of 2014, however, Joanne and Drew started trying to get A.J. back, saying they would do whatever it took. They agreed to drug treatment, counseling, parenting classes, and random drug tests. They were given weekly supervised visits to start, and photos taken during that time show a happy couple with a healthy baby. They both completed an intensive outpatient drug program and continued attending individual and group counseling sessions and took Suboxone, the medication prescribed to manage their opioid cravings. In July, they requested unsupervised visits with AJ, but that request was denied. By then, Joanne was pregnant. In October, AJ turned one, and his caseworker noted that he was thriving in his foster home, reaching all of his developmental milestones. In November, Joanne and Drew were granted unsupervised visits with A.J. On December 30th, 2014, Joanne gave birth to her third child, who was allowed to go home with his parents since neither he nor Joanne showed illicit drugs in their system, and Drew and Joanne were regularly attending their treatment meetings. A caseworker would visit their home twice a month to ensure the baby was being properly cared for. At the end of January 2015, the judge denied the couple's request for overnight visits with A.J., who was by then 15 months old, on the basis that they asked their psychiatrist for a higher dose of Suboxone. They had been sober for more than a year at that point. They were allowed overnight visits in April of 2015. In June, the judge ruled that Drew and Joanne could take A.J. home with them. The juvenile court case remained open, however, so A.J.'s care would continue to be monitored by the state during twice-monthly visits. 
AJ's legal custody remained with DCFS. During the summer of 2015, the couple continued drug treatment and counseling, and both boys were enrolled in a kinder care program four days a week. Joanne attempted once again to regain custody of Austin, but her mother, Lori, fought back. The two women had contact with each other because Austin, AJ, and frequently visited each other, but the relationship between mother and daughter was irreparably damaged. In July of 2016, Drew regained his law license on a probationary basis as long as he stayed sober and stuck with treatment. In February, Drew and Joanne were awarded legal custody of AJ. After the caseworker reported several visits with the family that appeared happy and healthy and two boys who seemed well-adjusted and well-cared for, the judge closed AJ's juvenile court case. There were no objections from their caseworker, DCFS, or the state's attorney's office. Things were looking up for the friend Cunningham family. By fall of 2017, around the time AJ turned three, cracks began appearing in the family's squeaky clean facade. Joanne let her cosmetology license lapse. She and Drew failed to re-enroll AJ in school, and he hadn't been seen for a checkup by his doctor at all that year. Most concerningly, Drew lost his house in a tax sale, and although the buyer sold the property back to Drew and Joanne in exchange for a $100,000 mortgage, they weren't making payments as agreed. Joanne stopped returning her relatives' calls and basically cut them off. On Halloween, Joanne and Drew took AJ and over to visit a new neighbor, Janelle Butler, who commented on AJ's costume saying he was a cute little mummy. She was surprised to hear that the gauze engulfing four-year-old AJ's head and parts of his face and torso wasn't just for Halloween. Joanne explained that AJ had burned himself by pulling a pot of boiling water off the stove and that they had taken him for medical treatment. No medical records or evidence of any hospital visit appear to exist to document the supposed visit, and Janelle told the Tribune that the gauze on AJ's head only partially covered bald spots where he lost hair. Over the winter, Joanne had a couple of run-ins with the police when she was accused of having a fistfight with another woman and sneaking out of a hotel without paying. She also, according to Lori, stood her son Austin up on Christmas, which broke the 17-year-old's heart. Joanne and Drew also resumed boarding roommates, although they had been cautioned by the court not to do so during their previous court case while seeking custody of AJ. 35-year-old Daniel Nowicki Jr. was among those they allowed to rent a room in their home. Daniel had a prison record dating all the way back to 2004 and a history of drug abuse. He also apparently had Joanne, who identified him as her boyfriend. I have no idea what her relationship was with Drew at this point, but Daniel was sick of living with his girlfriend's baby daddy, so he split in March of 2018. Two days after he left, Joanne was taken to the emergency room after being found asleep and disoriented in her car about 40 miles from home. Drew brought their two young sons to the hospital, where a social worker called the DCFS hotline, reporting that both boys were very dirty. Their clothes were inside out, and AJ had odd bruising to his face and forehead. She also told DCFS that Joanne, who refused to take a drug test, had fresh track marks up and down her arms, on her feet and neck. An investigation was launched. The DCFS worker assigned to the case was Kathleen Gold. Remember that name, because it will come up again. DCFS had a rule that the caseworker must make a good faith attempt to set eyes on the kids the same day the investigation started. But Ms. Gold somehow managed, instead of going to the Dole Avenue house, to show up at the house where Joanne used to live with her ex-husband Craig, where she hadn't lived since 2012. An entire eight days later, she finally found her way to 94 Dole Avenue, where no one answered the door. Another several days passed before she tried to reach the family by telephone. It wasn't until April 25, 2018, a full month after the hotline was called, that Ms. Gold finally saw AJ and in person when the two boys were playing outside the house. Ms. Gold reported that Joanne seemed stable and lucid, and that the boys were well cared for, clean, and appropriately dressed. Of course, by then, the bruises the social worker noticed at the hospital were long gone, and none of the records from DCFS indicate that Ms. Gold ever asked about them. For some reason, Ms. Gold didn't step into the Dole Avenue house until three weeks after that, when on May 17th, she met with the family inside their home for a safety assessment. Joanne admitted that back in March, she had relapsed on heroin, but she told Ms. Gold that she completed a five-day detox program soon afterward and was now using methadone as well as keeping up with her counseling and random drug tests. Ms. Gold's report read that the home seemed in good shape and the boys were well-treated and clean. 
After this meeting, Ms. Gold and her supervisor, Andrew Paulovin, another name that will come up again, made the decision to close the case as unfounded. By July, Joanne, who had done so well for quite a while, had relapsed again, doing 10 to 15 bags or about $100 worth of heroin a day. On a trip to Chicago to buy drugs, she ended up instead being admitted into the psychiatric unit of a hospital in the city for depression and suicidal thoughts after stating that she had a plan to step in front of a bus. The same month, she ended up at a different hospital again in Chicago, where she told staff she planned to kill herself with a heroin overdose. During that stay, she was diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder, depression, and PTSD. By August, Joanne was back together with Daniel Nowicki Jr. In September, the DCFS hotline got yet another call about the Cunningham Frund family, requesting a well check on the boys after the house on Dole Avenue appeared to be without power for several weeks. A police officer dropped by, but Joanne wouldn't let them inside. She told him the power was disconnected, but that she was trying to find somewhere else to live with her two boys, who the officer insisted on laying eyes on and reported that both seemed healthy and happy. Police referred the case to DCFS, who declined to open a case on the grounds that the family's utilities were shut off. In October of 2018, AJ turned five. It was the last birthday he would ever celebrate. During a winter snowstorm, the neighbor I mentioned earlier, Janelle Butler, witnessed AJ and who was wearing nothing but a diaper, sitting alone in a parked car while their parents had a loud argument inside the house. When Joanne came outside, Janelle tried to tell her to get help, but Joanne snapped at her not to call the cops again, peeled out, and didn't return for a week. In November, the police were called to a hotel in Palatine, Illinois, where Daniel Nowicki Jr. told them he and Joanne had just broken up and she wouldn't let him retrieve his belongings from their room. The police report on the incident made no mention of whether the two boys were there. By December, Joanne was back home with Drew, who agreed to take her back even though she was by then pregnant with Daniel's baby, which Drew said he would help her raise. Shortly after that, Daniel moved back into the house. In mid-December, Joanne barreled into a Taco Bell restaurant, crying and asking the staff to call 911. She said that Daniel, who had apparently moved out the week before, stole her cell phone and prescription meds. Police officers noted the two young boys in the back seat of her car as she spoke with them. Daniel was located nearby and refuted Joanne's account of the incident, saying they had argued after she tried to steal his medication. The only arrest made that day was Joanne, who was taken in for driving on a suspended license. Police visited the family's home the same day, which they described as cluttered, dirty, and in disrepair, covered with piles of clothes, bags, boxes, and dog feces. In the basement, there were stacks of garbage bags piled on garbage bags, which police found were filled with wet garbage. Police noticed that the boys' rooms smelled overwhelmingly bad, as if the dog used their rooms as its personal bathroom stalls. They also saw that AJ had a great big bruise on his right hip, which led them to take the boys into temporary protective custody and call the DCFS hotline yet again. An investigator, Carlos Acosta, remember that name too, came to the police station to interview AJ, who told him the bruise was from their dog, a boxer named Lucy, putting her paw on him the night before. Joanne told Acosta that she didn't know how AJ got the bruise, but that she had never hit her son. Acosta let Joanne walk right out of the police station with her boys as long as she promised to take AJ right to a doctor. Joanne did take AJ to the emergency room where he was examined by Dr. Joellen Channon, who was unable to determine exactly what caused the bruise. She took a few moments to talk to AJ alone, and once Joanne was out of the room, AJ said, Maybe someone hit me with a belt. Maybe Mommy didn't mean to hurt me. Dr. Channon told Carlos Acosta that AJ should be examined by a pediatrician and questioned by a forensic interviewer trained in working with children. He didn't require a pediatrician to examine AJ or an expert to interview him. He actually told Joanne that the boys could go home as long as Drew picked them up and stayed with them. He did stop by the family's house the next day, noting that the conditions had improved drastically compared to what the police reported the day before. Acosta checked in with his co-worker, Kathleen Gold, who had investigated the last complaint, and his supervisor, Andrew Paulovin, who was involved in both the complaint Ms. Gold investigated and the call from the hospital when AJ was born with drugs in his system. Despite all that, Acosta closed the case as unfounded on January 4th, 2019. Oh, by the way, 
Carlos Acosta was an elected McHenry County board member, for what that's worth. In February, the house at 94 Dole Avenue was sold in a foreclosure sale, but the family just stuck around for whatever reason. And that brings us to the morning of April 18th, 2019, when Drew Frund called 911 to report five-year-old AJ missing, and the scope of this tragedy unfolded for the world to see. The 911 call sparked a massive land and water search for the missing boy that lasted for several days. AJ's face was plastered all over the news, both local and national. Meanwhile, police, upon seeing the condition of the house, including finding mouse droppings in and around AJ's bed, called the DCFS hotline to allege environmental neglect and inadequate supervision, and DCFS took custody of four-year-old A doctor examined the little guy and found that he was healthy and did not appear to be abused. Drew offered to take a polygraph, saying that if he passed, he wanted to take home. Scent dogs were brought in the first day, but they only picked up AJ's scent inside the house, which police said indicated that he didn't leave the house on foot. That same day, Drew allowed police to examine his cell phone, where they found a search was performed on April 15th at 3.17 a.m. for the term child CPR. They also found a photo from April 17th of a shopping list, including some very suspicious items such as duct tape, plastic gloves, air freshener, and bleach. A search warrant was executed on the property and several items were seized from the home, including a pair of men's muddy gym sneakers, four empty bleach bottles, a laptop, and a roll of duct tape. Drew told police that the family generally went through about a bottle of bleach a week for cleaning purposes, which raised more than a few eyebrows. While being interviewed, Drew told police that Joanne believed AJ had Oppositional Defiant Disorder, or ODD, which, according to the Mayo Clinic's website, is defined by a pattern of hostile, disobedient, and defiant behaviors, angry and irritable moods, as well as argumentative and vindictive behaviors. Drew described AJ as thinking of himself as the leader of the home and being defiant, lying, and disobeying his parents. He admitted that they had taken to locking AJ in his room at night. A lot of the signs of ODD overlap with behavioral signs of child abuse, like aggression, hostility, anger, or hyperactivity. On April 19th, was interviewed at the McHenry County Child Advocacy Center. He told interviewers that his mom and dad had told him not to talk about AJ, and that his mom told him his older brother fell down the stairs and has a lot of owies. The same day, Joanne retained a lawyer, George Kalilis, and news cameras captured them outside the house where Joanne sobbed into his shoulder while Kalilis made a statement that Joanne was worried sick over AJ's disappearance and had nothing to do with it. That afternoon, police armed with a search warrant removed several more boxes and other items as evidence. The following day, Saturday, both Joanne and Drew attended a vigil in AJ's honor. On Sunday, Joanne and her attorney were interviewed by Good Morning America. I just want my kids. That's all I That's my life. for my kids. I realized that uh, the police um, uh, considered her to be a suspect. Based on that, I advised Min Cunningham uh, uh, to, to, to remain silent at that point. On April 23rd, detectives gained access to a video from March 4th that had been deleted from Joanne's phone, showing AJ lying on a bare mattress in a crib in his bedroom. The video appeared to have been filmed by Joanne, whose voice could be heard berating AJ for peeing the bed. AJ was naked except for some bandages around his wrists and his hips. He was holding an ice pack to his face, and when he pulled it away, deep red bruising could be seen around his eyes, and yellowish-green bruises were visible on his neck and upper chest. On April 24, 2019, six days after the 911 call, an FBI agent and a Crystal Lake detective interviewed Drew again and showed him the incriminating video. Drew said Joanne had caused those injuries. He then confessed that A.J. was dead, which he believed happened early Monday morning. As Drew explained to police, he had previously told Joanne that he wanted her to stop with the hard physical beating and try a less violent form of punishment, which they decided would be subjecting the little boy to ice-cold showers. Drew said that on Sunday evening, A.J. lied about his soiled underwear and was punished with some hitting and a 20-minute long cold shower. During the shower, Joanne forced the detachable shower head into AJ's face, causing him to lose his balance and fall in the bathtub. Afterward, Drew put him to bed, cold, wet, and naked. He said that during the night, Joanne got up to check on AJ and found him unresponsive, which was when she notified Drew and used his phone to search child CPR. 
Drew told police that the next day he took AJ's body to the basement, stuffing him into a large plastic storage tote, and that on the night of April 17th, he wrapped AJ in several trash bags, put him in the trunk of the car, and took him to an area about seven miles away near Woodstock, where he dug a shallow grave, buried his little boy in it, and covered it with straw. Drew led them right to the spot where police found AJ's little body, all three feet, five inches, and 70 pounds of him, buried in a shallow grave, just like his dad said. The same day, police seized more evidence from the home, including a shovel, AJ's mattress, several lawn bags, and a large plastic storage tub. The dog, Lucy, was removed by animal control. Drew and Joanne were both charged that very day with various charges, including first-degree murder, aggravated battery, aggravated domestic battery, concealment of homicidal death, and failure to report a missing or child death. AJ's autopsy showed he died from blunt force trauma to the head, which was inflicted in addition to blunt force injuries to his torso and extremities. Before his death, he inhaled his own blood. He also had abrasions on his forehead, consistent with the pattern of the shower head his mother shoved into his face. Another video from Joanne's phone was later described in court documents. This one was recorded on March 27th, and it depicts Joanne pinning AJ to the bathroom wall by his throat while AJ choked for air. Both parents could be heard in the video berating AJ and screaming and swearing at the five-year-old. In early May, over 5,000 people attended AJ's memorial services. He was buried in Superman pajamas in a closed casket with a cross engraved on it in the cemetery in Palatine next to his maternal great-grandmother. The headstone is etched with the words Loving Brother Andrew Frund, his nickname AJ in a Superman symbol, and Our Precious Little Hero at the bottom. A month after AJ's death, was interviewed again. He said he missed AJ and his dad and that he was afraid of two things, the dark and his mother. He told them, Mommy is a monster, that AJ used to get in trouble for lying, and that his brother had demons inside him because he was bad. Last I heard, was being cared for by the same cousin who raised AJ for the first year and a half of his life. Joanne gave birth to her fourth child, a girl, on May 31, 2019, while behind bars at the McHenry County Jail. The baby was taken into DCFS custody and is also being cared for by Joanne's family. A paternity test confirmed that Daniel Nowicki Jr. is the baby's father. Daniel died of a drug overdose in September of 2019 at the age of 36. Drew's law license has been suspended indefinitely for obvious reasons. A GoFundMe campaign was established to raise money for AJ's three surviving siblings in a trust, and as of this recording, total donations were almost $75,000. The funds are being administered by an attorney. The house at 94 Dole Avenue was deemed dangerous and unfit for human occupancy and has been approved for demolition. Violations inside the house include rodent and insect infestation, mold at a level above elevated, missing flooring and subflooring, trash, animal waste, and debris throughout the house, missing plaster and drywall, and locks on interior doors. The Crystal Lake City Council accepted an offer in January of 2020 from a Chicago company called Green Demolition Contractors Incorporated to demolish the house free of charge. As of this recording, the asbestos has been removed, and they're just waiting for a couple more things to be done before they actually take the house down. In December of 2019, Joanne surprisingly pleaded guilty to AJ's murder after spending months tearfully denying she fatally abused her son. Because of her guilty plea, the prosecutors agreed to drop all related charges, which means she avoids the possibility of being sentenced to life in prison. When she is sentenced, she'll face 20 to 60 years. Drew's next status update hearing is on February 27, 2020. AJ's estate has filed a lawsuit against Kathleen Gold, Carlos Acosta, and Andrew Pollivan, accusing them of leading a sham investigation and falsifying reports about their work on AJ's case. The suit alleges that instead of protecting AJ, the two men ignored credible reports of abuse, including multiple calls from law enforcement, medical staff, and neighbors. Acosta and Pollivan were also fired from DCFS, and Kathleen Gold, who was recommended for dismissal, voluntarily resigned. DCFS administrators have acknowledged that there were mistakes made in the agency's handling of AJ's case and have stepped up its training procedures and worked to reduce the caseloads of individual investigators. 
DCFS received a budget increase last year and has hired more than 200 additional staff. The state of Illinois is in the process of revamping its protocols regarding handling child abuse allegations in the wake of AJ's murder, and not a moment too soon, the Illinois DCFS Inspector General's report revealed that between July 1, 2018 and June 30, 2019, an utterly shocking 123 children who had contact with the agency died within 12 months of that contact. Prompted by A.J.'s death, Representative Steve Reich, a Republican from Woodstock who has been part of a bipartisan legislative group examining the operation of DCFS, proposed House Bill 4886, which would create an agency in McHenry County that would handle local child welfare cases instead of DCFS. The legislation would be called A.J.'s Law and would create a five-year pilot program in McHenry County that could be used as a model for the rest of Illinois to follow. The new agency under the jurisdiction of local government would be given all the powers and responsibilities of the Children and Family Services Act and the Abused and Neglected Child Reporting Act. Its purpose, according to Reich, would be to provide more responsive, effective, and efficient child welfare services to the people of this community. Funding for the agency, which would employ 15 caseworkers and be overseen by an executive director appointed by the chairman of the McHenry County Board, would be provided by the state. In addition, House Bill 5281, also known as the A.J. Frund Act, has been presented by Republican State Representatives Tom Weber of Lake Villa, Terry Bryant of Murfreesboro, and Joe Sosnowski of Rockford. The bill would give local law enforcement the ability to investigate allegations of child abuse or neglect, while current law exempts most immediate family or others living in the child's home from being investigated by police and requires the investigation to be done by DCFS. Representative Bryant has also introduced House Bill 5417 to improve training on online reporting for mandated reporters. Also introduced by members of the House Republican Caucus is House Bill 4832, which addresses unfounded cases of neglect or abuse. Austin, AJ's older brother, is now 19. His grandmother, Lori, is helping him through college, where he's currently a sophomore. I'd like to end this episode with a little more about AJ, the beautiful blonde boy with brown eyes and a wide smile. A statement made by his relatives read, While we had him in our lives, he had a happy, fun-loving life. This smart little boy loved having books read to him, doing puzzles, his Thomas the Train, playing with his fire trucks, bulldozers, cement mixer, and ninja turtles. He was very curious and always wanted to learn about everything. A.J.'s obituary says that A.J. had a smile that could light up a room and a personality to match. He was a loving, affectionate, and outgoing little boy, a virtual ray of sunshine to all who knew him, with a giggle and laugh that was uniquely his. A.J., now an angel to all of us, will be forever remembered in the hearts of everyone he touched, friends, family, and people near and far throughout our community. A.J. took very seriously his role as a brother to both of his siblings. You could often find him hugging and wrestling with his younger brother, watching over him always. Like many boys their age, the pair loved to play outside and indoors. You would find him drawing, reading books, or putting puzzles together. Of course, a photo always had to be taken to document his latest puzzle achievement. AJ would sit and play Legos for hours and was an extremely smart and friendly boy who could not wait to start kindergarten in the fall and make new friends. Rest in peace, AJ. The next portion is from episode 22, A.J. Frund Revisited, originally released on July 21, 2020. In that episode, I detailed Joanne Cunningham's sentencing hearing, which took place on July 16 and 17, 2020. You'll also hear several audio clips from the sentencing, some of which will be extremely disturbing. Some of the clips are also very lengthy, but I found all of it so fascinating and important it was hard to cut it down any further. McHenry County Judge Robert Wilbrandt, who has overseen both Joanne Cunningham's and Drew Frunt's cases pretty much from the beginning, entered the courtroom a few minutes after 9 a.m. Joanne Cunningham, wearing a gold ring with a cross on her left ring finger, sat at the defense table with her two-toned hair pulled back into two tight braids, dressed in flattering jailhouse orange. Crystal Lake Police Officer Kimberly Shipbaugh was the first witness to testify. She was the officer on scene on December 18, 2018, when she met Joanne and her two young boys at the Crystal Lake Taco Bell, where Joanne told her she had been robbed. 
AJ was assessed at a local hospital after Officer Shipbaugh visited the front home where she found the conditions to be deplorable and noticed a huge bruise on AJ's hip beneath the pull-up the five-year-old boy was wearing. Emergency room doctor Joellen Channon, who examined the bruise on AJ's hip in December of 2018, testified next. Dr. Channon testified that she did not want AJ to leave with his mother that day and requested a forensic interview from DCFS, but Carlos Acosta, the front caseworker, said it was not possible at the time. Carlos Acosta has since been fired for his handling of AJ's case. Assistant State's Attorney Randy Fries next played a clip of a video call between Joanne and her then-boyfriend, Daniel Nowicki Jr., who is both the father of the baby girl Joanne birthed in jail last spring and dead of a drug overdose as of last September. What's up, AJ? Hi, AJ. Is it cold or what? What's wrong? What's up? Why am I in a different place? Cause it's cause there's a lot of people in there, and I just didn't want to be over there. A lot of crazy people, a lot of crazy, crazy inmates, jail guys, bad guys. <laughs> I love you too, buddy. I love you too. I'll see you. I'll see you soon. All right. Between AJ and Daniel Nowicki, it sounds like there was more love than many believe Joanne showed AJ at any time during his life. This opinion was bolstered by the recordings prosecutors played next, in which Joanne denigrates and berates AJ, calls him names, and swears and snarls at him. While the recordings were played in the courtroom, Joanne sobbed and wiped at her streaming eyes and snotty nose. Brace yourselves. Did you take anything off your body? No, nothing, nothing, nothing off your ass. Oh, oh, I'm gonna take it. Oh, yeah, you swear to God, you swear to God, you swear on this family. I didn't. Do you swear on this family, yes or no? Oh, I do. Okay, awesome. What is this? What are those? This is from, no, this is, that's from piss. That's fucking piss. Not only, no, that's not from your ass even. That is, that is piss. Are you fucking kidding? And I just thought that was stuff from your butt. Oh, no, that's pee. Wait, is that pee? Put that in your eyes. Is that pee? Devil? So the devil's gonna get me in trouble? 
They got a little camp though. That's bullshit. Alright. Tell me that shit. I already know it. No. Uh, 
So why don't you want, why wouldn't you want daddy to be hurt or to go to a dad home? Just being a Huh? I want Because you think he falls for your shit? Mm -hmm. And because me and know? You want us gone? No. Then what? Say it. So, don't say I'm too cold. Why? So you cast spells on me for bad people to hurt me and do bad things to me. Is that what it is? No, I don't. You, you just said you hope. Yeah, yeah, that's, you said that's what you want. What bad people, though? What bad people do you talk to that would do that to me? Me and f***ing ever done to you? Huh? No, Is it because he doesn't, it's because he's, he sees through your fake-ass bullshit? Or why is it? Because you think you want to rule the roost and you're going to be king of the castle? What is it? What's not that? Then what is it? You think you can manipulate your dad? No. Where is it? It is because it is because it is so those bad people hurt you. That's what it is. Well, shit. That's what you just said. But why do you want them to hurt? Trust me on that. 
Who, do you really think you would do that? No. And why do you even bother trying if you, if you don't think that? Do you, do you think your dad is a pushover? Do you think that your dad um, really used to? No. No, I don't think. What? I said I don't think I can be a woman. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. None of it's going to happen. Ever. All I did was got this on tape for your dad to see. Everything I'm talking about, I'm telling him. On top of everything he already knows. The next person to testify was Dr. Ashok Mehta, a neonatologist from Centegra Hospital in Woodstock, who examined AJ shortly after birth. When AJ was born, was he drug tested? Yes. And did AJ test positive for any drugs at birth? Yes, he tested positive for opiates. Okay. Um, specifically, were you able to narrow down what type of opiates? Yeah, heroin was. Crystal Lake police officer Brian Burr testified next. He responded to the friend home on April 18, 2019, after Drew called 911 to report A.J. missing. The prosecution led him through a series of photographs of the interior and exterior of the Dole Avenue home. My initial entry on the side door, which is the main point of entry, I had sensory overload. The kitchen is the main point. When you walk into the kitchen, the subfloor is exposed. There was no room on the counters for anything at all. There was a ceiling that had a hole in it, had some water damage. Basically, more or less just filth is how I viewed it as. That's a, a chain lock with a padlock attached to the outside of the door frame that would prevent him from exiting the door, the room. D29, is that the slide as well as the chain lock? Correct. Outside of AJ's room? Yes. This is the interior of the room looking out into the hallway of AJ's room. D32? That's his uh, bed crib, makeshift bed, that was, I think, a crib converted into a bed for for him. All right, so this is D34, this is a picture of the windows in AJ's room? Correct. Okay, and then D35, what's this? That's also, they had a padlock, combination lock on his, on his closet in the bedroom. Okay, so there's a padlock on his closet. Is the padlock on the inside or outside of the door? That's on the outside. D37? That was some kind of a toilet they had in the room. Uh, I'm not sure really what that was in there. What, what is this a picture of? This is the, his window in his bedroom. Okay. And this device right there, what is that? What is that? Well, they had screws and they also had a, a metal hook that would prevent the window from being lifted upward. Okay. Was that on both windows? On both sides. Now, officer, after you had searched the house, could you tell the judge uh, whether or not you saw the defendant in there? I had, yes. Okay, and where was she? After we searched the house, she was sitting outside on the sidewalk under the, uh, the overhang from the house to the garage. She was sitting with her girlfriend. All right, and how would you describe her demeanor at that time? They were having a conversation, and she was laughing. That's what I'll never forget. It, it was so vivid in my mind. The prosecution then introduced some audio of conversations by telephone between Joanne and Daniel Nowicki on April 16, 2019, during which Joanne spoke of A.J. as if he was still alive, even addressing him directly at one point. A.J. died on April 14. Well, I was Crystal Lake Police Detective Frank Houlihan then testified. Rita Guerra introduced into evidence text messages sent between Joanne and Drew that appeared to be manufactured after A.J.'s death on or around April 14th, walking Detective Houlihan through the text messages. Again, this was all written after A.J. was dead. This was cold, calculated alibi building. What date range are those text messages from? Uh, April 16th, 2019 until April 18th of 2019. And during that time frame, at the time of those text messages, was AJ alive? No, he was not. It says, how are you and the boys doing today? I hope that you're all outside playing. Next text from <laughs> Joanne. Uh, if you get a chance, please do some research for ODD, psychiatrists, churches, etc. but only if you get a chance today. I'm still working on it. We can do this, especially with help. I feel like we have pinpointed what's happening. What did the defendant text? 
Okay, then don't worry about it. We'll do it tomorrow night. AJ ended up in his room, though, because he lied repetitively over and over and over again about breaking a cop. I literally was watching him around the corner. He took it, looked at it, and smashed it on the ground. And did Drew reply? He did. We really need to get that figured out. He's a good kid, but his lying is simply unacceptable. The boys have been so good today, minus a couple mishaps, but I told them that they can sleep with one of us tonight. So they're so excited. AJ helped me clean the entire house and everything. He's such a charmer when he's good. Lots of hugs today. The bullshit texts continued on the morning of April 18th when the dastardly duo reported AJ missing, discussing where they had already looked and where they should continue to look for him. All the while, they knew exactly where he was. Is that a text from the defendant to Drew? Yes. And what date was that sent? April 18th, 2019. And could you read her text message? Yes. Please also check the gas station. That's the only other place I can think of that he would know. Please, please ask them. And I looked everywhere, again, in the house, and I told him that if he comes out, he's not going to get in trouble. Just please come out. And so during the time frame that those text message conversations occurred, AJ was not alive. Is that correct? Yes. After Detective Houlihan stepped down, several clips were played from Joanne's police interview on April 18, 2019. So then I stopped everything I was doing, and we looked for him through the whole house, like 15 times. I said, you go check to the park, the park or in the gas station, because if he left. Well, then we went outside, too, and screamed for him. Sure, he couldn't. But he's... he's He's like, you know, he gets into things, so I lock his door at night. Up from the outside? Mm-hmm. When I felt worried. <sighs> okay. And there's so many creeps out there, you know, like, oh my God. I hope he's safe. He's got to be so scared. Listen, my, my shape of, you had nothing to do with this, correct? Absolutely not, no. Okay. okay. Following the video, Crystal Lake Police Detective Jeffrey Matson testified about attending a candlelight vigil shortly after A.J. was reported missing, which was attended by over 100 people. He saw both Drew and Joanne, who was accompanied by her attorneys. Next up was Crystal Lake Police Commander Richard Newman, who testified about calling in several other agencies to assist in the search, including the use of drones, search dogs, and one cadaver dog, as well as the FBI. Commander Newman said the FBI assisted for six days, working 24-7. He essentially testified about the huge amount of manpower and the unfathomable number of man-hours the investigation required, including the massive search for a little boy who was never missing in the first place. Crystal Lake Police Chief James Black testified next, essentially underscoring Commander Newman's testimony. It's clear Commander Newman and Chief Black were called to show how insanely costly Joanne's lies turned out to be. Chief Black even had dollar amounts on hand to answer questions on direct. After lunch, forensic pathologist Dr. Mark Whitech, who performed AJ's autopsy on April 25, 2019, described to the court the various injuries he found on AJ's little body. I'll warn you ahead of time, his testimony might be difficult to hear. The judge had previously ruled that AJ's autopsy photos would not be shown to or by the media. Could you just describe the injuries that you observed? Um, on the front of the face here, um, there's a number of abrasions up here, some of which are, um, there are multiple small circular abrasions. Some of them are irregular. All right. And prior to coming here to court, doctor, did you have the opportunity to review pictures of the shower head that was found on the second floor of 94 Dole Avenue? Yes, sir. All right. And how do those compare to the abrasions that you saw on the, on the forehead of AJ Friends remains? The multiple circular red abrasions here on the central forehead match the shower head that I was shown. All right, doctor, we're looking at E3. This is the uh, left side of AJ's face. Using exhibit 21, can you please describe the injuries, the outward injuries that you were able to observe? Well, um, on the left side of his face, um, it talks about marbling. That's just a decomposition change. But then you have multiple red abrasions as well as a blue purple contusion here just above the ear. The abrasions go from the forehead along the side of the head to the back of the head. Okay. Now, doctor, looking at People's Exhibit E3, it appears as though there's an indent in the top of AJ's head. Could you explain that to the judge? 
Um, he actually does have an indentation on the back of his or top of his head, um, what kind of looks like the back at this point on the photograph. Um, it's most likely from some type of pressure being on the top of his head after he died for a period of time. Um, when you put pressure on somebody that's alive and then you take the pressure away, it fills back in. But on a dead person, of course, it can't do that. So what AJ's head uh, was, was AJ's head swollen? Very swollen, markedly swollen. Let's look at, this is the right side of AJ's face. Could you please, using uh, People's Exhibit 21, could you please point out the injuries that you observed on AJ for the judge? Um, on this diagram, we see, again, abrasions towards the back of the head. We see multiple um, bruises or contusions on the right side of the face and along the jawline. Are, are you able to determine how many blows AJ's head absorbed? At least a dozen, but it's really difficult to say because probably many of the injuries are overlapping. And was there one in one place or two or three or more is hard to, hard to say for sure. Okay. Could it have been more than a dozen? Yes. Could it have been dozens? Potentially, yes. So this is the back of his head, um, and you see quite a large um, abrasion over here on the back of the head. And then there's actually an abrasion down here where the neck meets the head, and then there's more bruising behind the left ear. And are all of these abrasions consistent with blunt force trauma? Yes. All right, and doctor, again, there seems to be a depression or an indent in the back of AJ's head. Could you explain that to the judge? Well, again, as I mentioned before, um, his head is markedly swollen, and he was at some point uh, laying against something with the back of his head, having pressure against it from some object, and so that stayed as a depression um, until the time of the autopsy. And does that indent just illustrate how swollen his head was? Yes. So this is the inside of his mouth. Um, you have little skin tags that connect the top lip and the bottom lip to the jaws, and in his case, the lips are markedly swollen, they're bruised, and then the frenula, those little skin tags that connect the tissue, are broken in on the top and bottom. Is the frenula, the, these parts of the lip right here, sort of attaching the lip to the jaw? Yes. Okay, and those were, and those were broken? Yes. And would that result in bleeding? Yes. And uh, what kind of, and, is, and, and, and are those injuries consistent with blunt force trauma? Yes. Could you describe for the judge what you see? Well, basically, you see the front of the body from the mouth down to the feet, um, that big, green area over the abdomen that's just decomposition change it's not actually an injury um, although there are multiple injuries visible um, on his arms and legs bruises and abrasions could you just describe the injuries that you observed on uh, the um, anterior side of aging well again there's multiple bruises the green is just decomposition change there's some bullae or blisters here on the right thigh lower abdomen that's just, again, due to decomposition change. There are multiple abrasions and contusions on the knees, lower legs, and feet. This is his thigh um, at the um, top of the L-shaped ruler is one of the bullae or um, blisters that I mentioned. Those are most likely due to decomposition changes. Um, it appears to be some bruising on the thigh. So on the back of the body, again, you have some of the de green decomposition change. And then you have multiple abrasions on both elbows, the back, and then some excoriated areas um, and some red bruising on the buttocks. Okay, and what did you make of the red bruising on the buttocks, doctor? In terms of? Cause. Um, blunt force injury. Now, doctor, all of the injuries that you saw to AJ, could they all have been caused at the same time? Uh, they appear to have been in close proximity to each other, yes. Okay. Um, the first rib has a, an old fracture with a callus on it. Callus indicates that the fracture has been healing for a period of time. Okay, and the fracture to the ribs, could that have been caused by blunt force trauma? Yes. Well, both lungs showed what we commonly call leopard spots, which are indicative of inhaled blood. Um, and if you look at a leopard skin, it really actually looks like the spots on a leopard skin. But in fact, the spots are actually made of areas where the inhaled blood has gone into the lungs. Okay. Doctor, mo most people, even children, don't inhale liquid that's in their mouth, blood or saliva or otherwise. The 
fact that AJ was inhaling blood, what did that tell you? It tells me that he's probably either mentally compromised or actually unconscious. Um, did you examine his skull and his brain? Yes. Did you note any bleeding below the skin? Yes. Okay, and would you describe that for the judge? Well, basically his whole head um, is severely swollen and there's bleeding throughout the scalp and soft tissues over the whole head. What did that tell you, doctor? That he had massive trauma to the head. Okay, and the fact that it was all over the circumference of his head, did that indicate that he was struck in multiple areas? Yes. Okay, did you examine his brain? Yes. Okay, and what were your findings? His brain was massively swollen and what we say, or what we call herniated. Um, keep in mind that with the skull intact, there's only a few small holes for the brain to go when it swells up too much. Um, that includes the area where the spinal cord is. And his brain was so swollen that part of the brain itself was trying to go through that hole. And what that does is it crushes that area of the brain. And that's actually what causes death. When the brain is struck or, for example, when somebody um, falls off a couple story building and hits their head, the brain moves around inside the skull and can hit the inside of the skull. And then as the brain swells, um, the whole surface of the brain flattens out, which is what we saw here. And um, the brain starts to, well, crush itself against the skull. Does that affect uh, breathing? It will affect breathing, everything basically in terms of your internal functions. So, 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 so I guess would you describe the process of death for the judge? Well, basically he's received multiple injuries to his head. His brain is swelling. He's inhaling blood. His brain is swelling more. Now his brain is swollen so much that it's actually starting to crush itself against the skull because it has no place to go. And because it's crushing itself inside, well, the vital breathing, heart, all the different organs slowly but surely shut down and death occurs. Would this have been a painful death? When he was actually being injured, yes. Um, once he's unconscious, of course, no. Okay. And then in terms of the extent of the blood, blood force trauma, how does this compare to other cases of child abuse that you've seen? Uh, it's a pretty bad case. Not the worst one I've seen, but very bad. After that disturbing testimony, next on the stand was AJ's former foster mother, who was not subject to extended media coverage, so the cameras were turned off at that point. The prosecution also entered into evidence portions of Joanne's jail phone calls from 2019 to CBS2 reporter Brad Edwards, illustrating how Joanne's stories have changed over time. Please stay on your phone on March 4th. There was a video of AJ lying on a bare mattress in his bedroom. Okay, right. And you were, and you were berating him for urinating on his bed. Well, I mean, wasn't I mean, parents? I mean, yeah, he was doing this multiple times. It was the old uh, iPod OTP. I don't know if it is. I don't know what's what anymore. And I showed him. And it's true, yeah, and I showed Drew a friend's video to show him. So my question is, why would you record that? Because Drew asked me to record that and show them to him you know, because he was gone for so long during the day. I haven't even seen the news. I can't imagine what the news says. But what I have on my paperwork of my house being full of feces and urine and, and just unlivable and... They fled my whole entire house, and I would bring you in here there right now and show you everything that they say and are accusing me of is a lie. I, I mean, I don't even care about that the last lawyer said there's so many civil suits. I don't even, I don't even care about that. I don't. I did do a civil suit. It would go towards, like, like charity or something. I don't give a fuck about money. I want my kids. I want my family. That's what I want. I want my family. I would rather kill myself than hurt my family. I'd rather kill myself than hurt anybody.
The last person to testify was Dr. Robert Meyer, a clinical psychologist who met three times with Joanne for a total of three hours and completed a psychological evaluation on her in January of 2020. He did perfectly well on direct examination by defense attorney Richard Behoff. Is it common in cases of filicide or child abuse for a parent to target one child over another child? Yes, it is. Uh, and why is that? There's a lot of explanations. It's referred to in the literature as uh, spurning. You, you find one child. Is that <clears throat> Maybe common? because uh, for some reason they've had some problem with attaching to that child. The child may remind them of somebody some particular aspect that they direct their anger towards that one particular child. The explanation has to do with her early childhood experiences of trauma and in, her, were those? In, her, in her life. Her earliest memory, she reported to me, was really her father beating up her maternal grandfather. Her, her father being out of the picture, her mother remarrying, who she describes as uh, with the most vile of terms, being an addict, bringing different men in, not being there being abusive to her and her brother. She goes on to state that in the eighth grade, she was raped and following the rape, she had a suicide attempt in the eighth grade, requiring hospitalization, at least having her stomach pumped. By, her, by 15, she's uh, pregnant, uh, drops out of high school, um, and her mother uh, insists she has an abortion or she was gonna prosecute her boyfriend at the time. She then moved in with this boyfriend who she stays with for a while who also becomes abusive. Uh, at age 18, the one person that she kind of clung to in life through all this trauma was her brother, and he uh, dies of an overdose. Was that by suicide or was that an overdose? It, well, it, was, it was by suicide. Her ability to attach appropriately in relationships was highly disturbed. In what she, sense? She had... Uh, abuse in her first relationship she then got married said it was stable but he would get out uh, intoxicated and became abusive eventually breaking her ankle and what was significant about her breaking her her ankle she was introduced to narcotics at that time and what uh, narcotics norco hydrocodone the kind of narcotics for pain medications and those are prescription opioids that's correct and did she report common normal use of those or was it abuse she quickly began abusing them. I think her psychological makeup, the psychological pain that she experienced, she's attempted to deal with through denial and repression to push it out. And of course, narcotics really can help that, to numb you from experiencing anything. And I think she just found that too attractive to stay away from. Uh, and speaking of sexual involvement with uh, Andrew Friend and Miss Cunningham, how did Miss Cunningham self-report their physical relationship and their relationship in general with one another, being Miss Cunningham and Andrew Friend. She told, she described it as disgusting. She didn't want it, but felt she had no alternative, so went with it. She needed somewhere to be. Um, she found him to be just absolutely a hollow person, not there, not connected in any way, that it all revolved around drugs. During her marriage with Andrew Friend, was there another relationship that was ongoing as well? Yes, there was. And was that with an individual by the name of Dan Nowicki? That's correct. And what was unusual about that ongoing relationship with Dan Nowicki while she was married with Andrew Fred? Well, I found it unusual that they lived in the same house. They had a, a relationship together, all three of them. I don't, he tolerated and paid for it to a certain extent. Can you as, as though that? as though he was ignoring really what was the dynamics of what was going on. Her personality character, her character of her personality is highly disturbed. Her object relations that being how she feels about herself and others is extremely disturbed. I think there's an underlying rage. I think there's a, a lack of being able to trust and, and a great deal of pain. And that is emerged in almost every relationship she had. After the child was born she's and taken from her, that was her first rehab. And there may have been a, a period of sobriety a year or two after that. But sobriety, in her mind, is freedom from heroin. She was using other substances. What substances was she using? I believe at that time she was using Xanax and Adderall. And when did she start using Adderall? Do you remember approximately what year that was? It, I believe she, at least 2012, it may have been even before that, there had been some use of it. Certainly was, um, by 2015, she was using it, abusing it. 
How much was she prescribed? Do you recall? As best that I can call, recall, her prescription amount was somewhere between 20, 20 and 40 milligrams, which is and, an av average, normal. And how many times a day is that? One, once a day. And how much did she report using Adderall? By the time of the death, she stated she was up to 120 milligrams, if not more, every day. The frontal cortex is, so to speak, the, it becomes more complicated, but if you think about a car, that's the brakes. You have an emotion, and that part of your brain can kind of put the brakes on your responses. The limbus is just raw emotion. She had no brakes. She just had the emotional action. She had no way. She had lost the ability to control those impulses at times. The abuse of Adderall was the fuel, the rocket fuel that lit the underlying personality and rage that had been buried throughout most of her life. She reported that she recognized something had changed and she had become a more angry, violent person. Other people around her began saying that to her, even Mr. Uh, Nowicki. And she actually indicated to you, and you, I believe wrote this in your report, that she had, was having episodes of rage. Yes. And anger. That's right. In my opinion, she has a cluster B personality disorder. What is that? That is a, a character disorder, a disorder of character that is including antisocial, narcissistic, and borderline, particularly borderline traits. Now, borderline traits are uh, people that seem, even without substance, to have impulse control problems, that have extreme emotional mood deregulation issues. Prosecutor Patrick Keneally was an absolute rock star during this hearing, but he was on fire during his cross-examination of Dr. Meyer, who he treated with respect and dignity, even as he poked rapid-fire holes in the doctor's testimony and made it crystal clear that Joanne Cunningham knew exactly what she was doing. Is there anything you want to change in your report before we get started with cross-examination? Or is there anything in there that's not relevant to your opinion today? Um, I don't believe so. I, I know that you did talk about Adderall, but did you ever talk about the limbic system in, in any of your reports? No, I did not. All right. And in any of your reports, did you did you indicate that she that you were going to diagnose her with this cluster B or antisocial personality disorder? Uh, no, I did not. Okay. So these are all new statements? Yes. So you say that her profile is suggestive of significant personality dysfunction. Ms. Cunningham's responses indicate that she has a strong, anxious need to conform to the expectations of others, but she anticipates criticism, derogation, and abandonment by those with whom she is close. She has a fear of expressing emotions and of losing control and maintains a facade of control, rigidity, compulsiveness, and defensiveness. Through this facade, she tends to deny or repress, and it goes on and on for the rest of the paragraph. So again, a very sort of nuanced understanding of the deepest, most intimate parts of her personality, but you only met with her three times, right? That's correct. And that's for a total of three hours? Correct. Okay. And you would agree that there's probably a lot about Ms. Cunningham's psychology and profile that you can't really ascertain in two to three meetings. Would we agree on that? Yes, I'd agree with that. Okay. And so much of your opinion is sort of to the best of your can, to the best of your knowledge, based on the limited information that you have, is sort of to speculate as to how this may have happened. That's correct. All right. And you don't object to the word speculate? No, I do. All of the information that you use to make your assessment with regard to the clinical interview, the MCMI, the MMPI, all of that information was provided by the defendant. That's correct. Right? Okay. Uh, she could have lied to you. She could have given you inaccurate information. Is that true? That is true. Okay. And, of course, you would agree that had the defendant lied to you and provided you with inaccurate information, that would, have under, that would sort of undermine your results. That would undermine your opinion. That's correct. So we know from going through those that she's not exactly George Washington in that she lies. Correct. Okay. You're aware that she lied to the Crystal Lake police as well as the FBI about not knowing where AJ was. That's correct. She lied about not killing AJ. That's correct. She lied about not having abused AJ prior to his death. Correct. All right. And there was a lot of, like, intentional and premeditated lying. And what I mean by that is it appears as though she had thought out these lies and conspired with defendant friend to tell the same lies. Uh, that could be. I'm not quite sure on that, but I know she lied. All right. Are you aware from the Crystal Lake Police Department that she was sort of performative in her lie in that she went to the gas station to ask people that morning, like, has anybody seen AJ? Correct. Yes. Okay. So you would agree with me that the defendant is a manipulative person? Yes, I would. All right. Okay. The point of all of this lying to the Crystal Lake Police Department, as well as to the people at Gottlieb Hospital, well, that was to sort of protect herself from the, protect herself from the legal consequences of the truth. That's right. You weren't able to get a result from this test because you said the defendant responded in a, quote, exaggerated manner, endorsing a wide variety of extreme symptoms and attitudes. Is that correct? That's correct. So in other words, she's trying to make it appear as though she has psychological symptoms that she actually doesn't have. 
She was certainly exaggerating symptoms that appeared on that test. Okay, so she wasn't being entirely forthright. She wasn't being entirely honest. With that was the, yeah, that's what the validity scale suggests. All right, bottom of that page, malingering. Yes. What's the definition? Malingering is, uh, well, I'll read it to you from here. The, esen the essential feature of malingering is the uh, intentional production of false or grossly exaggerated physical or psychological symptoms motivated by external incentives such as <clears throat> avoiding military duty, avoiding work, obtaining financial compensation, evading criminal prosecution, or obtaining drugs. The DSM, there's um, certain criteria for when you should strongly suspect whether or not somebody's malignant, right? Correct. All right, and the first one is medical, and I'm quoting, medical legal context of presentation, e.g., the individual is referred by an attorney to the clinician for examination, or the individual self-refers while litigation or criminal charges are pending, right? Correct. Okay, that's a check, right? Correct. All right. And the second one is a marked discrepancy between the individual's claimed stress or disability and the objective findings and observations, right? Correct. And we kind of have that here in that she's sort of over-reported. There's a discrepancy between what the results of those tests say and what she's reporting, right? Correct. Okay, so that's a check. Correct. All right. Um, and then number four is presence of antisocial personality disorder, which you talked about on direct examination she may have. Correct. Okay, so based on the DSM, malingering should be strongly suspected in this case when she was talking to you. Is that fair to say? The other part of malingering is for some gain, and I don't see how my report benefited her in any manner. Well, you understand that the purpose of a sentencing hearing is for the judge to hear evidence in aggravation and mitigation, right? Correct. Okay, and you were called to provide, you weren't called to provide evidence in, in aggravation, right? Correct. Okay, and you certainly understand the general premise that the more somebody is sort of suffering from psychological, diffi di psychological difficulties or disorders, some might say they're less culpable for their crime. I suppose. Okay. And the results of that test were based on that test, you were able to glean that she has a strong and anxious need to conform to the expectations of others, right? Correct. Okay. Well, you would agree that others would expect her not to use and abuse heroin, right? Correct. Okay. Uh, you would agree that others would expect her not to use heroin while pregnant? Correct. Okay. You would agree that others would not expect her to use or abuse heroin while she's taking care of children? Correct. All right. You would agree that others would expect her not to beat her son to death, right? Correct. Okay. So she didn't exactly conform to the expectations of others based on your test, right? Correct. Okay. Beneath this controlled facade are feelings of insecurity that surface in the form of self-blame and self-punishment, right? Correct. Okay. Well, when talking about AJ, um, she described him according to you. On page four, paragraph seven, she said that AJ was difficult from birth, right? Correct. She talked about how he never listened, right? Correct. She talked about how he stole, right? Correct. She said that he was a very defiant and oppositional child, right? Correct. All right. She said that she described AJ as doing a lot of bad things, right? This is uh, page four, excuse me, this is the bottom of page four of your report. Correct. All right. She said he would steal money. Correct. Ms. Cunningham reported to you that he would break stuff. Correct. Sneak out of his room. Right. Wouldn't listen. Correct. Always had to have his way. Correct. All right. So in your report, she didn't really seem to have any problem assigning blame to AJ. No. Okay. And nowhere in your report did she explicitly or verbally blame herself for AJ's behavior, right? That's correct. Okay. And nowhere in her report did she ever say anything nice about AJ, did she? No, she did not. All right. So she never said that he was handsome. No. She never said he was uh, good at Legos. No. Never said he had a good sense of humor. No. Never said he was a good big brother. No. The fact that she was using and abusing heroin while she was pregnant with AJ, could that explain maybe some of his behavior problems? It certainly could affect AJ's brain chemistry and his behavior and defiance. It could. Right. The fact that AJ was isolated from other children, hadn't seen a doctor in over two years, didn't seem to have really any friends. Might that explain some of AJ's behavior problems? Yes. All right, the fact that he was locked in a room for prolonged periods of time, might that explain some of AJ's behavior problems? Certainly. All right. And the fact that he was subject to intense and ongoing abuse, if it's true that AJ had these behavior problems, might that explain some of them? Certainly. All right. All right. So let's talk about the, the Adderall and the rage. Yes. All right. Um, so you, according to her, she started reporting having rages in 2017, right? That's correct. And she was actually very specific about the date. She said that her personality began to change in December of 2017, right? That's correct. So prior to that, her personality had not changed caused by the Adderall abuse, according to her. According to her. Okay. Um, 
and she was initially prescribed Adderall by a physician in 2017. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. Now, did did she complain to her physician about the side effects of, of Adderall? Uh, I highly doubt that she was abusing it and buying it on the streets to supplement it. Well, did you ever, as part of preparing your opinion here today, did you ever talk to her doctor that had prescribed her Adderall? No, I did not. Did you review any of her medical records wherein she was prescribed Adderall for what, why, when, how much she was taking? I did not see those. Okay, so all of her reports of Adderall, that's based on what she told you? That's correct. All right. Uh, and she wasn't, and, and what she reported to you was that she was actually abusing Adderall, is that correct? Yes. So not only was she getting prescribed Adderall, but she was also buying Adderall off the street, right? Correct. All right. And had she been taking Adderall within sort of the therapeutic ranges of her doctor, she likely wouldn't have suffered from these ranges. Uh, yeah, if she had been taking it as prescribed, we most likely would not have seen these adverse side effects. Okay. Um, so, so again, uh, December 2017 is when her personality changes, but she was abusing Adderall well in advance of 2017, right? It's, it's uh, we try to put that together. As you mentioned, there's some maybe manipulative or lying or forgetfulness of when heroin was being abused, when cocaine was being used, when ecstasy was being used, when Adderall is being used. It's, it, it was very hard to get a, a real accurate time frame. She was on Adderall and Norco. Mr. Friend was on cocaine. Right. And this is on about the time that she moved into his house in 2012, right? So she was abusing Adderall as far back in, as 2012. It could be. All right. But between 2012 and then conveniently December 2017, no change to her personality. As far as she self-reports, true. Okay. Uh, are you aware that in December of 2013, which you should be because you reviewed the Crystal Lake Police Department, the Crystal Lake Police reports, that she was charged with domestic battery? Correct. Okay. And she pled guilty to a reduced charge? Correct. Okay. And that could have been caused by anger or rage? It certainly was, I'm sure. All right. And did you have a chance to review the divorce finding where in 2012 a divorce court made the finding that the defendant has been guilty of, quote, repeated acts of physical violence, including bodily harm and acts that endanger life or limb? That would have been in 2012. Were you aware of that? I, didn't, I did not see that. Okay, but we both agree that 2012 is well, in, is well before December of 2017 where she reports these personality changes, right? Correct. All right. And since you reviewed the Crystal Lake Police Report, you are aware that in October of 2017, James Rossow, a neighbor, reported seeing A.J. with a number of injuries and bandages all over him, right? That's, that's correct. And you and I would both agree that October of 2017 is before December of 2017, where supposedly she had this change in her personality and became violent. Correct. Okay. And she blames a lot of her bad choices on, on drugs, right? I would say that she would do that, yes. Yeah. And, and this Adderall rage that sort of changed her limbic system and, uh, and I guess she wasn't able to put the brakes on of her rage. It's interesting, though, because you have no evidence that any of this rage, aggression, or violence was geared toward anybody else in the world other than AJ. Right, correct. Okay. Uh, hatred, that can cause a person to oh, act yes. with aggression and violence. Anger can cause a person to act with aggression and violence, right? Right. Correct. Frustration, perhaps the regular frustrations of caring for a child, that in addition to Adderall can cause a person to act with violence. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. Lack of human empathy, that's certainly something that can contribute to violence. Absolutely. And you would agree with me that, that Adderall use is pretty common, right? Yes. All right. Um, in fact, it, it's, it's also one of the pharmaceutical drugs that's kind of regularly sought out by drug abusers. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. And you would agree with me that sort of the vast majority of people using or even abusing Adderall, just the vast majority of people don't commit child abuse, right? That's correct. Okay. And you would certainly agree with me that the vast majority of people using and even abusing Adderall uh, don't murder their children. That's correct. Okay. And you would agree with me that, that Adderall doesn't fully explain what Ms. Cunningham did. That's correct. Right? And you would certainly agree that Adderall does not justify what Ms. Cunningham did. I would agree with that. And antisocial personality disorder, that those types of people... Sociopath is kind of an anachronism. Would you agree? Like, there's no diagnosis for sociopath. The only, yeah, sociopath would fall under antisocial in this. All right, and what sociopath means is they just, they, they can't empathize with other people. So, or am I missing, is there other features of it? They, they're completely self-centered and they take what they want, fundamentally. All right. 
Um, so I'm just looking at the diagnostic criteria for antisocial personality disorder. Mm -hmm. A is a pervasive pattern of disregard for the violations of the rights of others uh, occurring since age 15 as indicated by three or more of the following. Mm -hmm. The first one is failure to conform to the social norm with respect to lawful behaviors as indicated by repeatedly performing acts that are grounds for arrest. Check. Yes. Deceitfulness as indicated by repeated lying, use of aliases, or conning others for personal profit or pleasure. Check terms of deceitfulness. Correct. Okay. Uh, impulsivity or failure to plan ahead. Correct. Okay. Irritability and aggressiveness as indicated by repeated physical fights or assaults, right? Correct. Check. Reckless disregard for the safety of self or others. Check, right? Correct. Consistent irresponsibility as indicated by repeated failure to sustain consistent work behavior or honor financial obligations. Were you aware that she wasn't working at the time that this happened? She yes. Was a serious I debt. I mean, that's probably a check as well, right? Correct. Okay, lack of remorse is indicated by being indifferent or rationalizing, having hurt, mistreated, or stolen from another person. We already talked about she never expressed any regret, regret or remorse to you, right? Correct. Check. Uh, the individual is at least 18 years old. Check. Correct. Okay, there's been evidence of conduct disorder with the onset before the age of 15. Conduct disorder means problematic behavior, right? Correct. Okay, so we know that she ran away from home when she was a kid, right? That's right. Pregnant at 15, apparently had an abortion. Correct. According to her, uh, depressed prior to eighth grade. Correct. So that's a check, right? Correct. Okay. Um, so, I mean, it seems like she very well may have antisocial personality. Disorder. That's why we put her in, as you see here, above a cluster B. Okay. I think she also has the characteristics, some of the other characteristics as well, in this category of personality dysfunction. What's the cure for antisocial personality disorder? Age. Okay. And there is some evidence that the symptoms reduce with age, but they don't entirely go away. That's correct. Right? So she's going to be a danger to herself or others in, to an enhanced degree for the rest of her life. Um, she would carry this personality disorder, correct? Okay. God, that was beautiful, wasn't it? After Dr. Meyer's testimony, both sides rested. I'm going to play Patrick Keneally's closing argument for you because it was absolutely spot on. If this guy ever runs for political office of any kind, I might consider moving to Illinois just to vote for him. Judge, I want to begin by calling your attention to the defendant's interview um, at the Crystal Lake Police Department on the morning of AJ's phony disappearance. Neither frantic nor hysterical, she sits waiting to be interviewed. And as she's sitting there, sort of looking around the room, getting acquainted with her, her, getting acquainted with her surroundings, if you look closely, she looks right at the video camera in the room recording her. Immediately, she begins to recite the Our Father, ending with her own improvised prayer for AJ's safe return. Two days earlier, knowing the jail is recording the conversation that she's having with her incarcerated, drug-addicted boyfriend, she asked AJ, who at this point was dead, and swollen body is wedged into a tote in the basement, she asks him to go and get her a Red Bull in a diabolical effort to throw off a police investigation that she knew was coming. Such is the depths of her depravity and deceit. Anything to keep others from knowing who she is and what she had done. I mean, my gosh, she had done these things knowing that a few days earlier she had beaten this little boy to the brink and then literally locked him in his room where he had to endure the bleak process of death all by himself. A process that was detailed to us by Dr. Wittick, which entailed AJ's head and his brain beginning to swell from the innumerable number of blows that he had received. His brain getting too big for the skull that it was encased in, pushing up against the side of it, cutting off breathing. And as he struggled to breathe, as he choked and he gasped for air, the generous amount of blood in his mouth was being sucked into his lungs, leaving imprints called leopard spots. At some point that evening, in the blackness of the room, the pain and the trauma to AJ's little body proved too much. And mercifully, he died. He died. Five years old, locked in a room, cold, wet, brutalized from top to bottom, totally and profoundly alone. Now, the first factor in mitigation that I'd ask you to consider, Judge, is subsection 735-5-3.1, 5 
backslash 2A1, whether or not the defendant's conduct caused harm. And when we think about the harm, when we think about the injury to AJ, it goes well beyond the uh, brutality that he endured on April 14th of 2019. He lived his life in the shadow of her darkness. A dystopian world where your mother hates you, scapegoats you, beats you for minor infractions, locks you in your room so that your childish exuberance doesn't get in the way of her benzo, amphetamine, and opioid abuse. A confusing and baffling world where your little body, which is not yet potty trained, can betray you and hand you over for more beatings. And when you don't have the words to defend yourself against your tormentor. A terrifying world. You're alone and you're entirely defenseless. And you know it because mother has explained to you in no uncertain terms, no way out, nowhere to run, nobody that can help you. AJ's clipped life after our social service agencies determined that this horror of a human being was a passable mother and all that that word is supposed to mean is nothing other than a long and a painful betrayal. But the real harm, the real injury caused by AJ's death, like the importance and the dignity of all human beings, is limitless. It's infinite. AJ is irreplaceable. Nothing we can do can bring him back. Nothing that we can give can get him back. But we're talking here, Judge, about a five-year-old child. As you saw in the video, this sweet, cheerful, affable little boy in all of his promise and all that was possible. This wasn't a quiet, peaceful death in his bed, surrounded by his loved ones. This was a scourging. Blow after unrelenting blow after unrelenting blow after unrelenting blow after unrelenting blow. All while being buffeted with freezing cold water. All with his mother howling and screaming in his face. And don't forget All of this agony, all of this pain, all had to be endured by the mind and the psyche of a child and all of the added sensitivities and vulnerabilities that come with that. And last thing I want to touch on, Judge, is just the harm to the community. I think it's fair to talk about because she enlisted their help in finding her dead son. This goes beyond the incredible resources that the Crystal Lake Police Department and the FBI had to expend getting to the bottom of the defendant's sick charade. We're decent people in McHenry County who have an instinctive bone marrow deep stake in the welfare of children in this community. And after the unspeakable truth about what she did to AJ came to light, I would describe the mood in this community as one of despair, and I think it still lingers today. Touching on some of the factors in mitigation, question is under 5735-5-5-3.1A1, whether or not there are substantial grounds tending to excuse or to justify the defendant's criminal conduct. We also need to consider section uh, 5-5-3.1A8, whether or not the defendant's criminal conduct was a result of circumstances likely to reoccur. And when we think about whether or not the defendant should be excused for her conduct or whether or not these are circumstances that are likely to reoccur, we really need to ask ourselves, well, who is this person that's sitting before us? And when we do that, I think we should ask ourselves, well, how was it exactly that she was able to get away with the sickening abuse and imprisonment of AJ for so long? And I'll tell you why. Because she is extraordinary at playing her public persona. The unassuming, sheepish, religiously devoted, long-suffering victim, as we saw with all of those tears during the interview, as we saw with all of those tears at the candlelight vigil, as we saw with the Red Bull stunt, as we saw with the stunt where she's texting her defense attorney about not being able to find AJ, how he's playing hide-and-seek. I mean, did you see her pre-sentence investigation? Just this long tale of woes, where she's just this object being acted upon, and nothing is ever her fault. A tale in which AJ is hardly even mentioned, except to insult him. No remorse, no regret is expressed. And she still will not let us write the final chapter of AJ's life by coming clean on what she ultimately did to him. Oh, a judge, she was abused as a child by her mother and her stepmother. Allegations that are denied. Oh, but judge, apparently she's been the victim 
of domestic abuse in every single relationship that she's ever had. Allegations that are also denied. She's the one that got arrested in 2013 for domestic battery. She's the one in 2012, a divorce court made the finding that she's guilty of repeated acts of physical violence. Oh, but judge, her personality changed in December of 2017 because of the Adderall. She's been abusing Adderall since 2012. And this rage is not directed at anybody else but AJ. Oh, but judge, she started using heroin in 2012 when she was put in jail as part of the divorce proceedings. And though she was pregnant with AJ, though his life and his health should have been preeminent, she starts using heroin and she continues to use throughout her pregnancy, such that she gets AJ taken away as a baby. Well, she gets him back as a little boy. Little boy getting in the way of benzo, amphetamine, and opioid abuse, lock him in his room. Little boy locked in his room, can't figure out how to potty train himself. Beat him. Tough little boy stands up to you. Isn't just going to lay down for your tyranny. Beat him harder. Well, now we got little boy's dead body getting in the way of benzoamphetamine and opioid abuse and magical new life with drug addicted, face tattooed, incarcerated boyfriend. Put him in a tote, hide him in the basement, and then bury him in a shallow grave. I mean, my God. We can begin. Somebody can begin to try to understand this, but you gotta do a couple things. The first thing that you need to do, Judge, is you need to completely suspend your humanity. Any sense of humanity, you just need to push it aside if you wanna understand Joanne Cunningham. The second thing you need to do is you need to appropriately prioritize her self-love. You have to ask yourself, what's best for Joanne? And then watch, through the tears, through the pleading looks, through the soft-spoken voice, as she tries to wriggle off her hook, if she tries to wriggle off the hook for her radical selfishness. She hasn't been sitting here crying for AJ. She's been sitting here crying for herself. What she did goes beyond any category of wrong, or bad, or very wrong, or really bad. It cannot be understood by the clinical pathological language that Dr. Meyer wants to attribute to it. It's evil. It's evil. And trying to understand evil, showing tolerance in the face of this type of evil, only begets more evil. Judge, taking into account all of the evidence, if ever there was a case that demanded the most forceful and maximum response, not only based on the nature of the case, but their own expert witness saying that she's going to continue to be a danger for the rest of of her life it is this case for the reason stated and to deter other people from committing the same offense we're asking for 60 years in the illinois department of corrections thank you for your attention judge joanne's defense attorney rick behoff who was assisted throughout the hearing by public defender angelo morilatos gave his closing argument as well essentially whining about joanne's awful upbringing and terrible taste in men leading to abusive relationships and then drug abuse asking the judge to look at her life in its entirety. I can't even be bothered to play it here. It was nauseating. Afterward, the self-styled star of the show, Joanne Cunningham, gave a tearful statement to the judge, positioning herself as a victim and begging for mercy. I had the privilege of having AJ as a son. When I had him, it was one of the happiest days of my life. I love him. I miss him. There's nothing I wouldn't do to bring him back. My children are the greatest gifts God could have ever given me. They're my whole world. They're the reason I breathe. Anyone who truly knows me can see how much I love being a mother more than anything in the world. Being a mother defines me. My children gave me a singleness of purpose, a love and inner joy that can never be replaced. My heart belongs entirely to them. All of my children are sacred, most precious treasures. I miss all of them so much. Words cannot describe it. AJ is smart, brilliant, handsome, funny, loving, special, beautiful, courageous, driven, talented, and absolutely loved. AJ carried a briefcase around every day because he was going to be a lawyer. He also wanted to be a garbage man, gas station attendant, doctor, and to work at the local donut shop. 
And he was convinced along with all of us that he could be anything that he wanted to be. I raised all of my children to do everything with love and joy. AJ's favorite donut is chocolate sprinkles. His favorite color is green. His favorite food is all food. Never pick a favorite because he loved to eat everything. His favorite toys are Legos. And he also loved playing Archangel Michael with a sword. My heart and my, my mind are consumed with despair, pain, sadness, grief, unceasing anguish, and extreme remorse. There's a great sorrow in my heart. I will never be able to justify anything, nor do I ever want to. Through my negligence, my weaknesses, and failures, it created a host of problems for me. It's difficult to understand or describe, but I'll try. I've always felt abandoned, unloved, insignificant, forgotten, and rejected. I've been mentally and physically abused, all without a single moment of encouragement, which slowly drained my heart of joy and peace. We all thirst for love of others. I've always been made out to be society's throwaways or outcast. I spent a majority of my life on autopilot, hanging on by a thread. My needs were enormous and my strength dried up. I had become a stranger to myself, a total stranger in my own mirror. Nobody will ever understand unless they've walked in my shoes or know the torment I've suffered. And I will try to rise above human scorn and judgment. I've never thought of my own well-being. And even if I did, I couldn't help myself. I was mentally unavailable even to myself. Unfortunately, I managed to dispel my anxiety, depression, and pain with drugs. Drugs were a band-aid, something to take my pain away. There's a pain inside of me that words will never reach. Only love knows the way. With a clear, sober mind, I know that God will never impose on me anything that I cannot bear. But sometimes I wish he didn't have such great confidence in me. We are all equal in God's sight. We all have done nothing to deserve God's love. But he loves us. God promises to be with us through our sufferings and ultimately to make us strong, firm, and steadfast. God wants us to persevere and persist through pain, through sufferings, and through trials of life. I may not understand why God allows a certain struggles in our lives, but I will put my trust, wisdom, power, and understanding in him. God uses us in perfect human beings in order to manifest ourselves. I am living proof of what mes- mental and physical abuse can create in someone. I plead with everyone to help me tackle this cancer. I beg you with all my, my whole heart. <laughs> Through this, <laughs> I am more than ever moved by the grace of God. I vow to take this tragedy that I created and help whoever I can possibly help. I am a child of God. I am a loving, kind, passionate woman who has feelings and loves deeply. I'm human. I ask God to make me a better person every day and to give me my heart and joy back. As much as I deserve punishment, I believe I deserve help. Please help me. For we all are fragile as instruments in God's hands and in need of God's mercy. I would give my life to have AJ back. This is something I will never escape from. I am impacted forever by my horrendous choices. I cannot change the decisions of my past. I ask you to help me put back the million scattered pieces of my heart back together. I need love, not more pain. There is a much larger reality here. I'm trying to manage to fight my way through the confusion, and it's not so easy. I often read Proverbs 3, 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. As I stand here with all the hurt and pain I've caused, I beg for forgiveness. 
asked for compassion, love, and mercy. My heart and mind failed me and my loved ones, and unfortunately, I cannot go back and change that. Not only do I ask for mercy, I ask you to not overlook all the good I have done. I need all the support, love, and guidance I can get. The poison of hate does not solve anything. I want my children to be proud of me. I think that was the biggest steaming pile of self-serving bullshit I've ever heard, and what an actual psychopath move trying to humanize AJ for the judge, talking about his favorite color, donut, toy, and all the other things she didn't give a shit about while he was alive. After that, court adjourned for the day to resume on Friday, July 17th at 1.30 p.m. when the judge would announce Joanne's sentence. Judge Robert Wilbrandt had plenty to say about the case and his reasons for deciding on a sentence before he actually handed it down. Initially, this court notes that it is bound by rules of law and must not be influenced in any way by sympathy, prejudice, or passion. As such, the court must specify exactly what actions of the defendant are before this court for sentencing. In other words, what did Ms. Cunningham plead guilty to, and what were the actions and offenses that this court should consider in sentencing her? First, the court is aware that there was a specific partial negotiated plea in this case that included a sentencing range that was submitted to this court and to which the defendant pled guilty. Although Ms. Cunningham was initially charged by the state with a variety of offenses and a 20 count indictment, she entered her plea to a single charge. One of the other counts dismissed by the state charged her with intentional murder. Pursuant to the terms of the partial negotiated plea, the intentional murder count, along with all the rest of the initial charges against Ms. Cunningham, was dismissed when the defendant pled guilty to count two of the indictment. As a result, Ms. Cunningham did not plead guilty to intentional murder and is before this court only on count two of the original 20 count bill of indictment. Count two, the charge to which she did plead guilty states that the defendant, quote, struck A.J. Friend on or about his body, knowing that said acts created a strong probability of death or great bodily harm to A.J. Friend and did thereby cause the death of A.J. Friend. Additionally, the charge of murder set forth in count two of the indictment was originally described as quote, exceptionally brutal or heinous behavior indicative of wanton cruelty, unquote. That finding could have led to a sentencing range of up to natural life in prison. But as a result of the partial negotiated plea agreement, that description was removed from the indictment. The original charge of exceptionally brutal or heinous behavior indicative of wanton cruelty is thus no longer before this court. The court is also aware that under our law, there are three separate definitions of first degree murder. First, if a person intends to kill another or do great bodily harm. Second, if a person knows that his actions create a strong probability of great bodily harm or death. And third, if a person is attempting or committing another forcible felony, sometimes known as the felony murder rule. Each of these three definitions carries with it a different connotation of murder. Still under our law, they all have the same potential sentence range, not less than 20, nor more than 60 years of incarceration. However, within that sentence range, courts must be cognizant of the type of murder case that comes before them. Here, the defendant did not admit to or plead guilty to intending to kill her son. And she did not admit to or plead guilty to the original count two charge of exceptionally brutal or heinous behavior indicative of wanton cruelty. What she did plead guilty to was that she knowingly did certain actions which created a strong probability of great bodily harm or death to A.J. Friend. What were these actions? 
The evidence presented here indicates that she repeatedly struck her son on the head with a metal shower sprinkler, took him out of the shower while he was still alive, locked him alone in his room, and then AJ tragically died from the after effects of blunt force trauma. It was a horrible death preceded by a horrible life. Still, to be clear, the single crime that is before this court today for sentencing has no finding that Mrs. Ms. Cunningham intended to kill her son and no finding that she committed the type of wanton cruelty that could have resulted in a sentence of imprisonment for natural life. This court has considered all relevant statutory factors of aggravation and mitigation and the evidence presented by both prosecution and defense. The court notes from the family history contained in our pre-sentence report that Ms. Cunningham's brother suffered from mental health and substance abuse issues and committed suicide in 2001. The defendant herself dropped out of school in the 10th grade, and shortly thereafter, she left her family home and began living with a series of male friends. Upon reviewing her history and her psychological status, there is no question that she has led a difficult life and has made a series of poor choices. Still, she worked hard to obtain her GED and successfully complete her studies at the Crystal Lake Cosmetology and Spa School. For a time, her life seemed to be looking up. And then came the drugs. Pursuant to People v. Smith, 214 Illinois Ave. 3rd, 327, 2nd District, 1991, this court will consider in mitigation the factor of Ms. Cunningham's long and sordid history of drug abuse that worsened her own mental health issues. It is clear that Ms. Cunningham has been addicted to heroin, Adderall, and various other illegal substances for a number of years, including those years when AJ was in her custody. As we know, AJ was born with heroin in his system. Still to her credit, she sought treatment for her addiction several times, but unfortunately, these treatments were not successful. She lapsed back into living in what can only be described as drug-addled filth, lying, cheating, and manipulating her way through life while terrorizing her small son. While her addictions do not justify her appalling behavior towards her own son, they perhaps do help explain why she engaged in what Dr. Meyer has described as Filicide, the inhumane, repulsive, and frankly shocking course of conduct that ended her child's young life. The use of illegal drugs most certainly played a leading role in that tragic story. This court is also cognizant of why this sentence is necessary to deter others, and how we all hope that through examining the history and the missed signals involved in this case, that other young boys and girls might somehow be spared this horrifying result. The heartbreaking story of five-year-old A.J. Friend has spurred our community to seek new ideas and look for new ways to prevent similar abuse in the future. And this court can only hope that such efforts will ultimately be successful and that children now and in years to come can be spared the disastrous life that befell AJ. Miss Cunningham was responsible for that life, and now she must be responsible for his death. Although the court recognizes that she was not convicted of intending to kill her son, and she was not convicted of wanton cruelty, after considering all the statutory and relevant sentencing factors, including the emotional harm done to the family and A.J. siblings, the court will sentence the defendant as follows. The court notes that the defendant was born on February 28, 1983, 
and she is now 37 years old. She is hereby sentenced to a determinate period in the custody of the Illinois Department of Corrections of 35 years to be served at 100% without statutory time credit reductions except for time actually served. And upon the expiration of that sentence, she will serve an additional term of three years of mandatory supervised release. Despite the judge's earlier warning against any such displays, members of the gallery sitting behind Joanne and her attorney shook their heads in disgust as her pathetic sentence was read. One good thing is Joanne will be required to serve 100% of her sentence. When she is ultimately released from prison, she'll be in her 70s if she survives that long, and then she'll serve another three years under supervised release. She will also be required to register as a violent offender against youth, her older son will likely be in his early 50s by then, and her younger kids will both be pushing 40. Almost immediately after the sentence was handed down, AJ's extended family released a statement regarding the sentencing. We, the family of our beloved Andrew, AJ, are disappointed and saddened by the ruling of the judge. We know that whatever the punishment, it will not ease the loss and pain we feel. AJ was an innocent, precious little boy whose life was taken from him after he endured what we now know was much pain and suffering. We had expected Joanne would pay for that by spending her natural life in prison. We also want to acknowledge everyone for their continued caring and support for AJ and helping to keep our little superhero spirit alive. Thank you so very much. The family's attorney, Peter Flowers, said that they are relieved this part of the case is over. He added, They continue working to also hold the Illinois Department of Children and Family Services accountable for their blatant disregard for AJ's life and safety. Over the years, Crystal Lake police officers, medical professionals, and neighbors all alerted DCFS about concerns they had for AJ. These reports were never fully investigated and in some cases ignored by DCFS caseworkers and supervisors. AJ was born with drugs in his system and spent the first 18 months of his life in foster care. He would have been far better off if he had stayed there, but Illinois, like most states, places way too high a value on family reunification, even in cases like this, where it's blatantly obvious that the child is safer elsewhere. AJ's family filed a federal civil lawsuit in 2019 against DCFS, which is ongoing. The caseworker in charge of AJ's case, Carlos Acosta, and his supervisor, Andrew Polovin, were both fired last year over their handling of the funds and their humane indifference for the safety of AJ and his little brother. The two men who were named in the civil lawsuit were also accused of falsifying reports in the case. Flowers said, Ultimately, our goal is to change the overall DCFS system so no other child in Illinois has to suffer like AJ. After the sentencing, Joanne's estranged mother, Lori Hughes, who raised Joanne's eldest son, said, She wasn't abused, traumatized, or anything else. Lori has previously told the media that her daughter is extremely manipulative which I think the prosecution in this case has done more than a good job of showing. Joanne's co-counsel, Angelo Morolatos, later said, Obviously she's remorseful for her actions. She pleaded guilty, and that in and of itself shows remorse. It shows she didn't want to risk spending the rest of her natural life in prison. It shows that she cares more about protecting her own ass than she ever did about protecting her own children. Prosecutor Patrick Keneally told the Chicago Tribune after the sentencing, we felt we put on an incredibly strong case that justified the maximum sentence. The house at 94 Dole Avenue where A.J. died was demolished in March of this year. A.J. will always have a special place in my heart. The smiling five-year-old boy with blonde hair and brown eyes was the first abused and murdered child I covered on Suffer the Little Children blog. A year later, his was the first story I chose to cover on this podcast. Why? Because to me, A.J.'s death epitomized a worst-case scenario in which every single person who should have protected him from harm failed him. The two who should have been most invested in protecting him, caring for him, nurturing him, and loving him, his own parents, did far more than fail him. They ended his life. They threw his body away like trash. My own two kids have been watching me react to testimony, feverishly tap away on my keyboard, wipe away tears, and mutter to myself for the past few days, and at one point, my teenager offhandedly asked me, Would you ever take in a kid like this? I didn't even have to think about it. The word yes flew out of my mouth like someone yanked it on a string. Absolutely nothing that happened to Andrew Thomas A.J. Frund was his own fault. Even if he had behavior problems, those were undoubtedly caused by the abuse and negligence of his own parents. He was born addicted to heroin, ripped from his mother's arms at birth, 
torn away from his loving foster family at a year and a half, and abused and neglected regularly from then on. He was forced to live in squalor. He was blamed for the problems within his family. He witnessed his parents' weird and dysfunctional relationship while his mother's boyfriend lived in the same home. He was locked in his room for every supposed transgression he committed. He was forced to potty train himself alone. And he was scapegoated by the people who were supposed to love him most. This little boy never had a chance. What he needed more than anything in the world was for someone to nurture him, to dote on him, to spoil him, to hold him in their arms and tell him he was the most important thing in the world to them, and above all else, to love him. That's it for this week, guys. Join me next week for another case. The following is a clip from episode 43, Case Update Special, originally released on December 23, 2020. In episode 1, I covered the story of 5-year-old A.J. Frund, whose parents reported him missing on April 19, 2019, from their dilapidated, trash-filled home in Crystal Lake, Illinois. Since that episode, a ton has happened in A.J.'s case, including some measure of justice, which I'll get into. I mentioned this in a subsequent episode, but in case anyone missed it, on March 4, 2020, the home at 94 Dole Avenue, where A.J. was beaten to death by his mother, was demolished. Neighbors and members of the Crystal Lake community lined the street to watch the House of Horrors come down and to honor A.J.'s memory. Many recorded the demolition with their cell phones. The house on Dole Avenue was in terrible condition, racking up 41 code violations, including mouse droppings, mold, missing flooring, subflooring, plaster, and drywall, animal waste, trash, and locks on interior doors, including AJ's bedroom and even his closet, both of which were padlocked from the outside. After it was deemed uninhabitable by the city of Crystal Lake, it stood unoccupied since the arrest of AJ's parents, Andrew Frund Sr., and Joanne Cunningham, almost 11 months prior. The house was torn down with all of the family's belongings still inside, reduced to a pile of rubble. Next is an update on AJ's case that I covered in episode 22, which was the sentencing of his mother, Joanne, who pleaded guilty in December of 2019. Her two-day sentencing hearing took place on July 16th and 17th, 2020. Episode 22 was full of fascinating and compelling testimony from the sentencing, at the end of which Joanne was sentenced to a pathetic 35 years in Illinois State Prison. At the beginning of August, Joanne was transferred to Logan Correctional Center in Lincoln, Illinois, to begin her sentence. There is some good news in A.J.'s case, at least. On September 10th, two former employees of the Illinois Department of Children and Family Services were arrested for their failure to act to save A.J. The DCFS workers in question are 54-year-old Carlos Acosta, who was the caseworker overseeing A.J.'s case in 2018, and his former supervisor, 48-year-old Andrew Polovan. After an internal investigation into their handling of A.J.'s case, DCFS Inspector Merrill Paniak recommended the men's termination, saying they ignored opportunities to intervene and failed to see the totality of the problematic history of the Cunningham Frund family, which included drug addiction and allegations of abuse and neglect. Both men left DCFS in December of 2019. At the time of his contact with A.J.'s family, Acosta's caseload was above the allowed threshold based on a federal decree. According to the Illinois Comptroller's Office database, Acosta's salary in 2019 was $95,900. Polovan's was $189,000. Each man was charged with two felony counts of endangering the life of a child and one felony count of reckless conduct. They both bonded out almost immediately, and their cases are currently pending. Finally, during a negotiated plea hearing on the afternoon of Friday, September 18, 2020, Drew Frund accepted a plea agreement in which the majority of his criminal charges were dropped in exchange for his guilty plea to three charges, aggravated battery of a child, involuntary manslaughter, and concealment of a homicidal death. As a result of the agreement between the prosecution and the defense, Judge Robert Wilbrandt sentenced Drew on the spot. For count one, aggravated battery of a child, a Class X felony, Drew was sentenced to 11 years in the Illinois Department of Corrections, with three years of mandatory supervised release to follow. He will serve a minimum of 85% of that sentence. For count two, involuntary manslaughter, a class two felony, Drew was sentenced to 14 years in prison with two years of mandatory supervised release. He will serve a minimum of 50% of that sentence. For count three, concealment of a homicidal death, a class three felony,
Drew received five years in prison with one year of mandatory supervised release. The three prison terms are to be served consecutively for the protection of the public. Since he was given credit for his time served since his arrest, which totaled almost 17 months, that means Drew could be walking the streets as early as February of 2038. According to the Illinois DOC website, Drew's projected parole eligibility date is January 23, 2043, and his projected discharge date is January 24, 2046. When Drew is released from prison, he must register as a violent offender against youth. He must also cooperate in the ongoing DCFS investigation into AJ's death, including giving truthful interviews. Finally, he must participate in a series of interviews with the FBI's National Center for Analysis of Violent Crime, Behavioral Analysis Unit 3, for research purposes, which will take place over a period of several days. I hope to God they publish those interviews or at least the transcripts. I don't believe Drew was physically responsible for AJ's death, but he certainly had every opportunity to intervene. He knew what Joanne was doing to that little boy, and he allowed it. I'm very interested in the psychology behind that mindset. Drew's DOC profile currently shows his offender status as reception, and he's located at the Northern Reception Center of the Statesville Correctional Center. He will remain in reception status until he's transferred to a permanent institution. The processing time varies for each inmate at the reception center, where privileges and movement are limited. In his prison photo, he looks a bit like if the Unabomber and Santa Claus had a baby who was born elderly and homeless. I can't deny I shed a few bitter tears after Drew's sentencing hearing ended. AJ stole my heart from the moment I first saw his photo. He was the first child I covered on both the blog and the podcast, and after combing through his story over and over again, I can't help thinking he deserved better, both in life and in death. I'm sure we can all agree that his murderers, particularly his mother, for actively committing the ultimate betrayal against her son, deserve more time in prison than they received, but I can't fault Prosecutor Patrick Keneally for negotiating plea bargains with both Joanne and Drew. Prosecutors often do so for a variety of reasons, not the least of which is to save the state's taxpayers millions of dollars for a costly trial. On top of that, there's no guarantee that taking a defendant to trial will result in justice either. If we learned anything from the 2011 trial of Casey Anthony for the murder of her two-year-old daughter Kaylee in 2008, it's that even the most obviously guilty defendants can be acquitted if the prosecution's case fails to live up to the CSI standard. This is what will have to serve as justice for AJ, at least as far as his parents are concerned. No matter what, though, I know I'll never forget AJ, or allow his memory to fade, or his face to be forgotten. Next up is a clip from episode 86, Case Update Special number 3, originally released on October 27, 2021. If you've followed the podcast or suffer the little children blog.com for any length of time, you're probably familiar with the story of five year old AJ Frund, who was the first child I covered on both the blog and later the podcast, and whose story I've followed closely ever since. AJ was reported missing in April of 2019 by his parents, Drew Frund and Joanne Cunningham, who were arrested shortly afterward and soon led investigators a few miles from their home on Dole Avenue in Crystal Lake, Illinois where police found AJ's little body buried in a shallow grave, wrapped in plastic garbage bags. As I've previously reported, AJ's mother, Joanne, pleaded guilty in December of 2019 to her middle son's murder. She had abused AJ both mentally and physically for years, but her final act of violence was a savage beating with a shower head while forcing AJ to take an ice-cold shower as punishment. He died hours later after his brain swelled to the point of herniation. The update in AJ's case concerns two additional defendants criminally charged in relation to the five-year-old's death, those being former employees of the Illinois Department of Child and Family Services, or DCFS. Carlos Acosta was the child protection specialist caseworker overseeing the extensive history of the Frund family, and Andrew Polovin was his supervisor. Both men were terminated from their DCFS positions in December of 2019 in the wake of AJ's death and in September of 2020, based on their negligent handling of AJ's case, they received felony charges of endangering the life of a child and reckless conduct. Both were soon freed on bail. They have pleaded not guilty to the charges against them. In January of 2021, the Illinois Attorney General's Office announced that certain statements made by the two men cannot be used in their criminal prosecution. Because of their positions, they could not decline to participate in the internal investigation into their handling of AJ's case. 
As a result, according to Assistant Attorney General Michelle Camp, their statements were coerced and therefore not voluntary, and as such, could not be used in their prosecution. The case against Acosta and Polovin has moved at a snail's pace. Court hearings have been repeatedly continued to later dates, and no trial date has yet been set for either defendant. The most recent status hearing on October 19, 2021, was continued until November 3rd at 9 a.m. Tracy Kotzman of the organization called Roar for AJ has attended every court date without fail, and I really want to give Tracy a huge shout-out for her dedication to AJ's case as the most ardent and vocal supporter of justice for the tiny, blonde five-year-old boy whose story gripped countless people in McHenry County and all over the world. AJ would have turned eight years old on October 14th. The following updates are the most recent developments in AJ's case as of mid-August of 2022. In late March, while serving her sentence in the Logan Correctional Center, Joanne Cunningham filed a five-page, handwritten post-conviction petition in which she claimed that at the time she killed AJ, she had been seeing demons and believed both she and her five-year-old were possessed. Yep, this is going to be just as ridiculous as you think it is. Joanne filed her petition pro se, meaning on her own without an attorney's help. With the petition, she was seeking unspecified relief under the Post-Conviction Act, claiming that after her arrest and during her court case, her 14th, 8th, and 6th Amendment rights were violated. Joanne's petition stated that she was not represented properly, claiming her attorneys did not allow her to testify on her own behalf in court. Mind you, her case never went to trial. She accepted a plea agreement, and she was allowed to ramble on for several minutes while giving her self-serving statement at her sentencing hearing. When she was arrested, Joanne claimed in the petition, the officers never read her Miranda rights before she was questioned by detectives. She also said her excessive sentencing violated her Eighth Amendment right. Although she was on psychiatric medications for a long period of time, Joanne wrote, she was not monitored by a doctor or mental health professional while she was held in the McHenry County Jail. These medications, she claimed, caused severe side effects, including hallucinations, both during her pregnancy and after. As you probably remember, she gave birth to a daughter about a month after she was arrested for AJ's murder. Joanne also claimed in her petition that when she killed AJ, her participation in the offense was a direct result of her suffering from postpartum depression or postpartum psychosis. I guess the court was supposed to ignore the fact that postpartum anything literally means after the baby is born. She complained that her attorney did not present any evidence of her psychosis to the court. Defendant believed that she was possessed and that her son was possessed. Defendant was seeing demons and hearing voices. Defendant went to her priest, chaplain, and co-parent and asked for help with this matter, telling them that she needed an exorcism. The co-parent of her children was there through the whole experience that the defendant had with the demons she was hearing and seeing. Judge Wilbrandt, the same judge who sentenced Joanne, had 90 days to decide if her petition had merit. He didn't take that long to make his decision, however. On June 1, 2022, he dismissed Joanne's petition, writing in his response that Joanne's constitutional rights were not violated. The pleadings in the petition, he wrote, do not provide the gist of a meritorious claim of substantial deprivation of a federal or state constitutional right and that they are patently without merit. At Joanne's extensive sentencing hearing, the judge wrote, witnesses were called on her behalf and her defense attorneys presented wide-ranging evidence of her drug abuse and substance abuse treatment history. He also mentioned the statement Joanne herself gave, which addressed her long-standing history of both prescribed and illegal drug use. While in jail, Judge Wilbrandt wrote, Joanne was certainly entitled to mental and medical health care, but an exorcism would appear to be beyond the purview of any recognized constitutional right. Despite her claims that her medication caused her to kill her son, the judge wrote, Joanne makes no claim that these medications affected her guilty plea, nor does she assert how these medications or their monitoring contributed to her sentence. The final update in AJ's case, at least for now, is really not much of an update at all. The criminal cases against the former DCFS employees involved in catastrophically failing AJ have not yet been decided. Carlos Acosta and Andrew Polovin are due in court on August 30, 2022, for a status hearing. It appears Judge Wilbrandt has been recused from their cases, which will be reassigned to another judge. 
The federal lawsuit against both men, which also names former caseworker Kathleen Gold, is still pending in the United States District Court, Northern District of Illinois, Eastern Division. My sources for this episode were the Chicago Tribune, Shaw Local, Crime Online, Davenport Family Funeral Homes and Crematory, People, Facebook, WGN-TV, Patch.com, The Northwest Herald, The Chicago Sun-Times, The Daily Herald, CNN, ABC7 Chicago, CBS2 Chicago, NBC5 Chicago, The Putnam County Record, MyStateLine.com, The Oklahoman, The Lake McHenry Scanner, Live-Streamed Courtroom Video, The McHenry County Court Website, The Daily Chronicle, and The Associated Press. That's it for this week. Join me next week for another episode. If you like the show, please follow or subscribe to Suffer the Little Children on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, Spreaker, Pandora, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast listening app. And please leave me a five-star rating and a positive review on your favorite podcast platform. Visit the website at SufferTheLittleChildrenPod.com where you can listen to episodes or become a patron for rewards ranging from a shout-out by name on the show to bonus content and exclusive gifts. Follow the podcast on Facebook, Instagram, Tumblr, and Pinterest at Suffer the Little Children Pod, and on Twitter and TikTok at STLCPod. View photos related to today's episode on Facebook and Instagram. For more stories like the one you heard today, visit SufferTheLittleChildrenBlog.com. This podcast is researched, written, hosted, edited, and produced by Lane. All music for the show is licensed from audiojungle.net. Email tips, comments, questions, or case suggestions to sufferthelittlechildren.pod at gmail.com. For more information about preventing or reporting child abuse, visit childhelp.org or call your area's child abuse hotline. If you see something, say something. Until next week, bye everyone.